This podcast is brought to you by Mizzen and Maine. Don't worry about the spelling. All you need to know is this. I have organized my entire life around avoiding fancy shirts because you have to iron them, you sweat through them, they smell really easily, they're a pain in the ass. Mizzen and Maine has given me the only shirt that I need. And what I mean by that, and Kelly Starrett loves these shirts as well, is that you can trick people. They look really fancy, so you can take them out to nice dinners, whatever, but they're made from athletic sweat-wicking material. So you can throw this thing into your luggage in a heap or on your kitchen table like I did recently, and then pull it out, throw it on with no ironing, no steaming, no nothing, walk out, and you could probably wear this thing for a week straight or make it your only dress shirt and take it on trips for weeks at a time. Never wash it. It will not smell. You will not sweat through it. You got to check these things out. So go to fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, fourhourworkweek.com forward slash shirts. Check it out, fourhourworkweek.com forward slash shirts, and you'll see some of my favorite gear, including the one shirt that I've been traveling with. This episode is brought to you by 99designs, your one-stop shop for all things graphic design related. I have used 99designs for everything from banner ads to book covers, including sketches and mock-ups that led to The 4-Hour Body, which later became number one New York Times, number one Wall Street Journal. And the brainstorming, a lot of it took place with designers from around the world. And here's how it works. Whether you need a t-shirt, a business card, a website, an app thumbnail, whatever it might be, you submit that project and designers from around the world will send you sketches and mock-ups and designs. You choose your favorite and you have an original that you love or you get your money back. It's that straightforward. And many of you who are listening have already used it and created some amazing things that I'll be sharing in the future. But in the meantime, if you want to see some of my competitions, some of the book covers, as well as get a free $99 upgrade, go to 99designs.com forward slash Tim. That's 99designs.com forward slash Tim. Optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start to shake. Can I answer your personal question? Now I would have seen an appropriate time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over metal endoskeleton. Hello, ladies and germs. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where I deconstruct world-class experts, whether they be chess prodigies, incredible billionaire investors, celebrities like Arnold Schwarzenegger, or, in this case, one of the most capable and notorious computer hackers on the planet, who happens to also be a good buddy of mine, Sammy Kamkar. He is a beast. He's also a well-known whistleblower and entrepreneur. So, we could start with what he's probably best known for, which is creating and releasing the fastest spreading virus of all time, which was the MySpace worm called, aptly enough, Sammy. And of course, he was subsequently raided for it by the United States Secret Service. Yes, he was prevented from touching computers for three years, but he's also done many other things. He created Skyjack, which is a custom drone that can hack into other nearby parrot drones and uh, basically create a swarm of drones that someone like Sammy can control completely. Uh, he's also known for creating Evercookie, which appeared in top secret NSA documents revealed by Edward Snowden. And he has also spotted some what you might consider bad behavior. So he discovered illicit mobile phone tracking where Apple, in the case of the iPhone, Google, Android, and Microsoft Windows phones were transmitting GPS and Wi-Fi information to their parent companies. And his research on this has led to a series of class action lawsuits against the companies and a privacy hearing on Capitol Hill. So he is a controversial figure. And for those interested after this uh, interview in delving more into a lot of what I've done with Sammy, he is one of the experts that I rely on in the dating game episode of the Tim Ferriss experiment, which is the number one TV season on iTunes. As I record this, he helped me to hack my online dating and test a bunch of things that seemed ridiculous and ended up working. And of course, we had Neil Strauss of the game and a high-end matchmaker and other people that we tested. But you can check out that episode, which is really fun, on iTunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss. Two R's and two S's. That's iTunes.com forward slash 
Tim Ferriss, T-I-M-F-E-R-R-I-S-S. We also have some bonus footage from the episode with Sammy that is on Vessel. And if you're interested in content distribution, this is also just a cool site to check out. And you can go to Vessel.com, that's V-E-S-S-E-L.com forward slash Tim Ferriss. And you can find a bunch of videos. I'll be adding more. And uh, you can see all of these for free for the next 30 days. Just have to sign up. So without further ado, I want you to enjoy the very thought-provoking, terrifying, and instructive Constructive conversation with Sammy Kamkar. Sammy, Tim. Well, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. It is so great to see you again. It has been a while since our adventures in TV land. It has. Yeah. And <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and I have wanted to I have wanted to introduce you to my fans and this audience for so long already. And I think a great way to do that is to explain a few things that are right in front of me. So you, okay. have a, you have a necklace on. Yes, I do. Can you explain what is on your necklace? And I hadn't seen this before today. Sure, sure. Um, so this is something, uh, it's actually a microcontroller. So it's basically a little mini computer that sits around my neck um, that I've programmed to into something that I call USB drive-by. And basically what USB drive-by is, is it's something that I wear around my neck, obviously. And any computer I plug this into... It, within about two seconds, takes it over forever. Um, essentially, if you've ever plugged in a keyboard into your computer, you know that you can just start typing keys. Well, the, the awesome thing about computers are that, and keyboards is that you can do anything from a keyboard. You can open, you know, if you're on Windows or OS X, you can open like a spotlight or the start menu and start typing. You can say, open a terminal, go into the network preferences, make all my network traffic go to another server. So now, if you plug this in, all of your internet traffic, whatever website you go to, any email you check goes through my computer. So I can see where you're doing, where you're going. Um, additionally, it evades a firewall. There's like a firewall where it actually asks, do you want to allow this connection to this random server, sammy.pl, that you've never heard of? Yeah. Well, you can, thanks to this firewall, you can just hit oh, enter, <laughs> right? To hit the <laughs> accept button. So it's like, oh, I'm just going to hit accept. And this thing is, you know, it's a couple, like, Two inches, you know, two inches by oh, yeah. an inch or something. You barely right? even notice it as anything uh, <laughs> other than decorative. But, of course, it, you're not a steampunk <laughs> burner, last I checked. Uh, so it actually has a function. Right, right. <laughs> so, I've, I've, you know, I've actually made a video on this. I've released it entirely open source for anyone to see how it works, actually use it. And the idea is not to actually be malicious and use this against people, but to demonstrate sort of the flaws that exist in our everyday computer's in systems like USB that have existed for years and years and years that we don't really think about. Yeah, I've you know, and uh, there's there's another toy I want to get to in a second, which also blew, <laughs> blew my mind. Uh, although it didn't entirely surprise me, given the conversations we've had in the past. But uh, I I at one point was chatting with a former intelligence officer for I think it was MI6, and he now does private security in uh, Silicon Valley and other places, and he said that. <clears throat> If you, if you were to go to, say, a Facebook or a company like that and drop off malicious USB drives that were branded with the company logo on them and just drop them in the lobby where people check in, uh -huh. that you know, 75 to 80% of them will get picked up and plugged into a computer Oh, I'm sure. Uh, on, on campus sure. somewhere. That, yeah, it seems like a high percentage, but I, I believe that. Yeah. I mean, man, uh, the, the problem is... You'll plug in, I'll plug in almost anything. Yeah. Right? Well, the lobby is key because you also get visitors who think they're getting, they've found something valuable. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> All the dignitaries. Oops. Yeah. There's a couple, there's a couple of music artists, you know, I love going to, uh, to shows and there's a couple of artists. I think like Bass Nectar has thrown out USB sticks, which I think is great, right? Yeah. With like unreleased music. And yeah. I just want to go to Coachella and just throw these things out. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> the drive by USB. Right. Exactly. Oh Jesus. <laughs> Sammy, you terrify me, but you also delight me. Tell me, <laughs> tell me about this this other toy, and it is okay. a toy, right? This is a toy. I mean, it's not a toy. Well, it's a toy. <laughs> it was a toy. It was a toy. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, I haven't released any of this stuff out yet. Uh, well, is, and where can people I find will. the video? Just to backtrack for a second. Sure, of, sure. Um, my website has everything. So Sammy pl. That's S A M Y dot p l. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will link to all these things in the show notes as well for everybody. <laughs> so this is called uh, the Mattel IM Me. Um, this is a product for uh, essentially tweens, and it says pink. You know, I call it. I think it's fuchsia, but uh, <laughs> it says girl tech on it, and you can essentially text your friends. And it's Mattel. You know, came out with this many years ago so that sort of teen kids could text their friends. Um, 
without you know finding you know running into the wrong the creeps and the wrong people it's restricted to who you can communicate with but it happens to have a really cool wireless chip that a couple other people out there uh michael osman and a few other people have have found that this wireless chip is actually really really powerful much more powerful than texting teenage girls um it's actually able to listen and transmit on a wide number of frequencies including some things that i found recently like a, a ton of Almost all garages, uh, high-end luxury vehicles. <laughs> Have you, if you've ever used, let's say, a remote, you know, a lot of cars these days, you hit a remote to unlock your car. Let's, right. Let's, quick, quick. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beep, beep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's all with radio frequency. And normally that's supposed to be encrypted, or at least it's supposed to be really hard. And the, the thing about security that I've learned over time is that if we don't see it, we just assume it's safe. <laughs> right if you can't see it <laughs> right if, if it's not cool. an open door to your house exactly right <laughs> as long as you don't know it's happening um it's kind of and it's i mean it's true ignorance is bliss but uh, not until someone steals your car uh so this is something that i've been working on too and that's something I, i've been demonstrating uh, and will come out with pretty soon Mm -hmm. um, with being able to take this Mattel toy, which is now discontinued, but you can get on eBay for pretty cheap, mm -hmm. um, modify it. So like here, we're actually seeing, uh, just different frequencies and, and I'll I can, take, like, and I'll take a photo of this for you guys as well. Cool. Um, so like, uh, Michael Osman is another hacker who, who builds amazing stuff and he's built this, uh, spectrum analyzer, which shows us frequencies and I've modified it here to actually record things. So like if I take a car key, uh, we'll actually see a spike here whenever I hit the button. Mm -hmm. And a lot of cars, you hit a car, you hit the key to unlock, and then you get in your car and you just press a button now. And that's wirelessly communicating with your key as well. You don't even have to put a key in the ignition in most cars. Yeah, it was, was very confusing to me when I first used it. Yeah, you just leave it in the center console or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were stuck in there for like 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, trying to figure out how to like, turn the I car on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Showing my edge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so essentially, that's also with radio frequency. You press the button and it sends a signal to your key to ensure that it's there. So this device i've essentially programmed it to record that information um <laughs> and it has to do a few more tricks to uh, get over a few hurdles and then i can now start your car unlock it and drive away <laughs> and, and fortunately this only works on nicer cars <laughs> <laughs> well you know this is uh, i remember when we did uh, some of our experiments in online dating and we'll definitely talk about some of your amazing adventures in the world of online dating <laughs> but uh, when I did an episode that involved uh, breaking into cars, which is a whole separate story, but uh, noticed that a lot of the higher end, in this particular case, Japanese vehicles were mm. really easy to break into. Easier than like old, broken down pickup trucks oh, in some awesome. cases. And it's just astonishing uh, to realize that in certain cases, you know, the security with the most expensive category of a product is the most vulnerable. Oh, absolutely. It's a, it just it really it really astonished me to realize that. Well, you find in a lot of nice neighborhoods the doors are unlocked. <laughs> yeah, oh, right. yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. And what I found, you know, in this particular case, this was a a uh, a week of experimenting with urban evasion and mm. picking locks and getting out of handcuffs and all this stuff. And uh, by the end of two or three days with a very minimal set of tools, I could open all of the cars that the staff had rented awesome. who are, who are working on the show, including like GMC Yukons and like some very expensive higher end cars. Uh, how did you learn to do this kind of thing? I mean, where, where did you start to develop this interest in this skill set? Yeah. Uh, because I'm, you have hmm. such a breadth. I mean, you have familiarity and comfort with software, obviously in programming, but now with hardware, where did all that start? Uh, the hardware or just the all the software? The hacking. hacking. The, the hacking. hacking. Okay, the hacking. Um, the hacking. I mean, it started. It started early on. Uh, so yeah, I, I just lived with my mom when I was younger, um, and she worked a lot. You know, mm -hmm. she had well, you know typically two jobs, and um, she got me a computer one day. I was probably like eight or nine. She got me like a brand new computer, uh, and I said, "Hey, mom, you know, like, can I have internet? Can I go and?" And she spent all her money on this, on this brand new computer, because she knew that I had nothing to do. Right. Right. I was at home. It was summer. I had no summer camp or anything. I was just at home. Um, so she knew I like computers, and uh, she spent everything she had to get me a new, this computer. And I got the internet. 
And that was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> and I go on there and I find that, man, there's like so many amazing websites dedicated to the X files, <laughs> which, <laughs> which was awesome because I love the X files. So I spent all day on, on these websites about the X files. And I thought, man, I'd love to really talk to people about the X files. So I got into, uh, I found a message board and I, I about the X-Files. So I posted on there. I was like, hey, guys, I really like the X-Files too. Let's talk. <laughs> and I kept hitting refresh, right? It was back, back in the day of message boards. Uh, I guess we still have them. They're called forums now. And uh, I was refreshing and refreshing. I just wasn't getting the immediate response like I, I would on you know Yahoo or Metacrawler back then when I'd search. So I found something called the chat room, IRC. And I got in there and I went into a, a chat room and... I was like, hey guys, I want to, who wants to talk about the X-Files? And, which is my favorite show at the time, if it's not obvious. <laughs> and, uh, someone said, get out. I said, what? What do you mean? I just want to, I just want to chat. Mm. Right? Let's just hang out and, and chat, chat about stuff. He's like, get out. And I said, no. I mean, I'm not sure if I said no, but I didn't. <laughs> and then he said, you have 10 seconds to get out. And I was like, okay, random person I don't know on the internet. What are you going to do? And 10 seconds later, Something happened. My computer crashed. And <laughs> I panicked. I turned beet red. I you know, couldn't speak. I was sweating. And I'd never encountered a computer crash before, especially on the first day that my mom had just bought this and spent all of her, her savings and money on this thing <laughs> right. um, that I just destroyed, potentially. I waited for like 10 minutes. Uh, didn't, want, didn't want my mom to find out. Disconnected from the power, connected back in. Thank God it still worked. And as it was coming up, you know, adrenaline rushing, kind of like fight or flight mode, I said that was that was the coolest thing ever. How do I do that? You were and, hit by a wizard. Yeah. And how I do I develop my own magic? Yeah. And, and not that I want to destroy people's computers, but the, the, the ability, uh, the, the power. I mean, there's something really intoxicating about that feeling about being able to do that. And that's what got me down to say, okay, well, how do I do that? And then what was the next step after that? The next step, I learned about these things called DOS attacks and LF service. And this was like Windows 95, right? It was, it was a long time ago. And uh, <laughs> I was going to say, it's a pretty good one to attack. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I downloaded a program that did this. And then Windows... Uh, a, a DDoS uh, just program. A, uh, no, just a DOS. DDoS. Okay, not DDoS distributed. DDoS is new. DDoS is like right. a newer thing. Um, maybe that came out in like 10 years ago because DOSs were no longer effective. Right. <laughs> um, so this was just a DOS attack. And, uh, denial of service, denial of service, making a website unavailable to other people. Exactly. Website or computer. or computer or yeah. computer. Yeah. And this wasn't even overwhelming. It was just a, a specially crafted packet that you would send to somebody. And Microsoft patched it one day and I was like, Oh no, my, 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 my wizard, my electronic gone. letter bomb doesn't work anymore. Exactly. And I said, well, someone devised a way to create this program. How can I do that? How can I make my own? It was called WinNuke. How can I make my own WinNuke? So I then learned how WinNuke, win win exactly. <laughs> so back then you called it nuking, not dosing, but nuking. <laughs> and uh, I, I started learning how that specially crafted packet you know, modified memory on a Windows computer improperly, corrupted something in the kernel, and then would cause it to crash. What and, is the kernel? Um, just for those not oh, sure, familiar, sure. which might yeah. include me. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the <laughs> I've heard the word a lot. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The, the kernel is, is basically just the brain. It's the mm -hmm. brain of a computer, typically. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, a typically more advanced operating systems like Windows, Mac, Linux, they'll have a kernel that handles all the system functions. Like it makes sure your keyboard works and your monitor works um, versus your normal software that sits on top of the kernel. Got it. And that from there, I mean, I had learned how to... Uh, Learned how to start writing software, and a lot of it also came from gaming. Um, you know, I played Counter Strike a lot. I actually got into Quake and uh, Doom, then Quake, then Counter Strike. I was probably like fourteen, playing Counter Strike all day and all night. Uh, and I was, you know, I played so much that I got good, but I wasn't the best. I thought, how could I be the best? <laughs> and I was playing one day, and I had two speakers left and right. And someone comes up behind me. And in Counter-Strike, you can see where all your teammates are. You have like a little radar, uh, a heads-up display, where you can see your teammates. But you can't see enemies. And I heard footsteps. They came from my right speaker and then came and then you know panned to my left speaker. But I didn't see someone on my radar. So I knew if they're not on my radar, it must be an enemy. But since I couldn't see them, they must be behind me. And I thought about that for a moment. There's information going from my right speaker to my left speaker. That means there must be positional information about the enemy. How do I get access to that? 
So that's when I learned the fact that these packets from these other players are coming to my computer over the internet, and they have positional information of where to play footsteps. So if you have surround sound, you'll properly hear how far, how you know, the amplitude, the volume of those footsteps, and where it should be panned. And once I understand, uh, understood, and learned about packet sniffing, where you can just see the packets, see the, the actual traffic going over the internet, I could then locate every person that I on the map, enemy or friend. So I then created my own cheat software, and that placed everyone on the map. I mean, I could see through walls. I actually added opacity. I started learning about how, how to reverse engineer uh, the OpenGL, which was the graphics library that was used. So all the graphics that are displayed, when, when something says it should be, be a wall, I said, you know what? You should actually have a 50% alpha transparency. I should be able to see through it a little bit. <laughs> so you, know, you see some guy crouching. Turn you into Superman. Yeah, exactly. You see some guy crouching. And uh, behind a box, and I know exactly where he's crouching. So I just run and do like a you know matrix flying jump and shoot him, you know headshot. And then the game wasn't fun anymore. Um, and, and actually, you know, soon after that, I was probably 15 at that point. Uh, there was a software called Punkbuster. And just to, just to take a quick pause, you were in Pittsburgh. Where were you at the time? 15. Okay, so uh, so. I was born in uh, I was born in Pittsburgh, correct? Um, when I was 13, my mom was like, "Do you want to move to LA?" And I said, "Okay." And uh, we got in our we got in her car and moved to Los Angeles because she wanted to be in LA. And I thought that was cool. It's a hell of a drive. Okay, so 15. Not to interrupt. So now you're in LA at this point. Yeah, 15 in LA, uh, in like Arcadia, Pasadena area. Um, and at this point, it was about far enough that I had kind of had enough of high school. Um, not for any good reason. I just didn't enjoy it. So I just stopped going. Uh, my mom was working a lot. So she like, <laughs> she was at work. I mean, she couldn't tell me not to. <laughs> <laughs> so I would go, I would just stay home and play Counter-Strike, uh, and then work on cheats and uh, Counter-Strike immediately became unfun. I don't know if you ever played with cheats, but like when you have cheat, when you have this God mode, it's not fun anymore. And fortunately, God mode should be the name of your mem- <laughs> memoir, by the way, <laughs> when you write it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so as soon as this, uh, as soon as the cheat, as soon as I was using the cheat, I would also release it as open source so anyone else could use it and just see how to do this kind of stuff. Uh, I found uh, they actually created this software called Punkbuster that prevented my cheat from working. And all of a sudden it became fun again. Because now it was it was like a cat and mouse game. How do I modify my software so that they can't detect it? And we went back and forth. So I'd release a new version That's of my fun. software. It was very So fun. the game became the cloak and dagger defeating yes. of the punk buster. Yeah, absolutely. And similar applications there, similar and, software. And I mean it was that. You know, at this point I'm fighting against a you know, a, a company full of employed developers and you know, you know, engineers. And I get to sit in my room and just uh play against them <laughs> right <laughs> and that that i would say taught me to understand this stuff kind of pretty you know at that point just understanding how to break down a problem and how to break down those types of problems reverse engineering you're trying to modify something that you don't actually have the source code to you know uh counter strike wasn't open source so when you hit a wall or had a block of some type how would you learn how would you problem solve how would you how would you try to address that? Uh, if I hit a block of some sort, so I think uh, I think I've broken down things to I pretty much if I have a problem, whatever that may be, whether it's technological or in in life, uh, and I will take something and I will try to look at two things: inputs and outputs, and that's how everything in a computer works, and that's that's why I think this way probably. There are always a number of inputs, puts, sometimes none, but there's typically something that goes in and something that comes out. And I usually want something to come out a certain way. Um, and I look at that and I say, what else comes out that way? Under what input conditions can I make something come out this way? Have I actually tested all the possible input conditions? You might think with a computer, okay, well, if I give it, you know, if I want to take something out of memory, if I want to like read a program that I'm not supposed to, what are all the inputs? I can like, mash the keyboard. I can send every possible keystroke. Uh, maybe there's no keyboard. How can I, you know, use the mouse in a certain way? But then you think, you just think a little bit further, like what if you take all those 
easily readily available inputs away, what other inputs are available? And then you start to think about like the environment. What about the temperature? You know, if you actually freeze, if you actually take like nitrogen and apply it to uh, memory, you can freeze memory, and then you can pull it out. Uh, you know, they didn't have to do this with uh, with uh, Ross Albrich, uh, Albrich, if I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, the Silk Road. Ah, yes. They didn't have to, but yes, indeed. <laughs> if you, that's if, a whole separate story. That's a whole, who yeah, who that's was a whole apprehended a, less than you know five miles from my house? Oh, that's Insane. so crazy! It's such a crazy story. Yeah. <laughs> the, so, yeah. No, definitely. Sorry. Continue. Uh, oh, um, so yeah, I'd say pretty much looking at all the possible ways I can send information or I can control the input. That's that's how I. Uh, <laughs> What would be an example of that from your Counter Strike days or any other days? What would be sort of a real world example of of how you say, "All right, hold on a second, let me look at the inputs and and outputs in this particular scenario." Okay, sure. Um, so let's take uh, something new, uh, new that I'm working on right now uh, that I have some demonstrations of, um, and that's <laughs> hijacking cars. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So, uh, first it was, how can we start cars? Like how, what, what is my goal, right? What is my intention? Um, and um, obviously my goal is not to steal cars, but to show fallacies and ways that we can protect against this as well. Uh, but to protect against it, you have to understand it. Right. Um, so how do I start a car normally? And I'm looking at these cars where, uh, you either use a key or you don't use a key. Now when it's cars that use a key, it, it's actually pretty simple because it's pretty easy to replicate keys. Uh, there's plenty of bump keys available. There are a number of ways to break into the car. Yeah, bump keys make make getting into cars really easy. <laughs> <laughs> You've learned that. You've learned have, that. Have. <laughs> My car safe out there? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's gone. That's all right. I won't. I won't have it for long. Awesome. <laughs> um, so. That, uh, and that's, uh, and that's actually really interesting. A lot of hackers, you know, every year there's a really big conference in Vegas called DEF CON. It's been going on over 20 years now. And they actually have a huge lock picking area. So it's, cool. Yeah. And it's not even, you know, a lot of them are hackers. A lot of them aren't. A lot of them are just straight lock pickers. That's what they do. They want to be able to break every type of lock. And it very, it's very much the same as hacking, right? It's how, what, how can we control the environment in a way to produce the output that we want of this, you know, tumble lock turning? Um, even though I don't have the, the proper equipment, the key. So for the car, it's like, okay, well, I'm pushing a button. That must be doing something. And I know that it communicates with my key somehow. I don't, I don't know how. Um, because there's nothing else. Because when my key's not there and I push a button, the car does not start. I see. You're talking about the non-insertion key in this case. Yeah, correct. You, For in yeah. this case, I'm talking about the non-insertion key just because the doing it with the insertion key has been done over and over again. Right. Um, so now it's the, the newer models of everything are now you don't have a key that you insert. You just keep it in your pocket. So as long as you have a key on you, you can start the car. So I want to say, okay, well, how is that communicating? And uh, I look at the key. And in some cases, the key will actually have like a model number. Um, in the U.S., you actually have the F FCC. You're actually regulated where you can, what you can transmit and receive. So pretty much any device you so have, you know what the band is. You know what the band is. If you look at the back of any phone, it'll have an FCC ID. And at least in the U.S. Oh yeah, look and at that's that. Because it Looking at the back of an iPhone. Yep, and because it transmits or receives. So from here, you can actually look look up that uh, band, like you said, right? The frequency band. Then you look at how can I listen to that frequency band, um, and I found some devices. I found some. Awesome now, would you just Google how do I listen to X Y Z band? Or? <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, I Google everything. <laughs> um, can, can you share what we were talking about? Sure. <laughs> so my car is really small, and it's, it's well, let's can we be specific? Sure. There, it's very low. It is low. Okay. It's a Lotus. It's a uh, Lotus, which I just like. Oh, scrambled and struggled to get out of earlier <laughs> and just looked like a complete idiot trying to get out of it's a great car but it's very hard for me to get out of so yeah the, the top is on it's pretty hard to get out of when the top is on and uh i man when i got it i loved it um that's another time i really used google immediately because i'd never driven stick before hmm. so they shipped it to me they delivered it at uh like there's some place in Hollywood and I had to drive it home and I'd never driven stick. So I'm sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting in it on my iPhone looking at like, I'm wikihow.com. I think some, you know, I Googled, how do I drive stick? 
<laughs> and that's so I learned on the way. I didn't learn well. <laughs> that's a hard. That's that's a, that's a really rough entry. Oh man! <laughs> into manual so, transmission. Yeah, dro- drove home, stalled a few times on the one and a half miles home, <laughs> but um, I got out and just was an idiot and just like stumbling out for five minutes trying to figure out how to pull myself out of these bucket seats yeah. because yeah it, it's just it's kind of like imagine that you have like your pants pulled down to just above your knees and you go down to a full squat and then you have to like dive forward it's <laughs> it's like ergonomically very similar so you googled so yeah so i you know i, I drove it around the first week and man i yeah, pulled up somewhere nice place bunch of people i had my brand new car thought this this felt good not just a brand new car brand new lotus <laughs> brand new lotus and i'm like this this feels good yeah. i open the door and i like <laughs> struggle <laughs> and i'm like should i just get back in and drive away <laughs> i think some people saw me <laughs> so after a week of this just embarrassment i google how do i get out of a lotus <laughs> And to my surprise and delight, people have documented how. And I found a YouTube video that was very instructional. I gave it a like. Um, I did not leave a comment <laughs> that I needed to learn. But I learned how to get out of my car through the YouTube video and, and online because it was, it's just really embarrassing. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, I learned how to you have, use one arm, you use one hand on the steering wheel, and you pull that because that is firmly connected to the car. Is the other hand on the side of the chair, and then you just thrust thrust your arms as you, <laughs> you emerge. You, you, you Superman out of the uh, phone booth. Of, yeah, you Superman, and then smoothly catch your balance. <laughs> and the, so the parallel here with the band, if, if you look at the back of a phone or device or the back of a key, and you're like, oh, look at this. There's an FCC registration. Right. And I can identify what the band is, the frequency band is. Correct. For this, uh, this wireless key. Right. Uh, for whatever brand X car happens to be. Uh, and then the next step is Googling or determining how to listen in on that frequency. Correct. And you know, you don't, if you don't know, and I don't know much about frequency bands, but I know that, you know, when you're listening to FM radio, that's a frequency band FM, that that's actually frequency modulation. It's a type of, it's a way to communicate data. What is AM amplitude modulation? Exactly. Amplitude modulation. It, it, they actually adjust the way that they're sending data. Amplitude is like volume. So they're changing the volume to send data where frequency, they're actually changing the frequency. So when you listen to 105.9 FM, you're listening to 105.9 megahertz and your, the, the frequency is actually changing from like 105.8 to 105 point, uh, you know, or 106. That's actually why, you know, you can listen to FM radio a little bit off, right? Sometimes you hear FM if you're a little off. So uh, that's that's another frequency. And a lot of these actually, car keys use AM. Um, they're not an AM that a radio in a car would listen to, but they are AM. So it's the size of the wave, not the number of the waves in a given time frame. Um, for amplitude, it's it's essentially like how much, uh, how powerful that wave is. I, I see. It's like volume, right? It's like yelling versus being you know, quiet. Right. Um, so that's the difference in, in amplitude and modulation is just a fancy word for change. Mm-hmm. So, and, uh, and then what would be the, the next step after that? So, uh, so, yeah. So I found a few different devices that I can use that are low cost and a couple people, you know, a couple of security researchers have made a lot of this stuff, uh, readily available. I mean, uh, it was other researchers who found that you can use this Mattel toy to actually listen to a wide number of frequency bands r- rather than, you know, in the past, just a few years ago, it cost thousands, thousands of dollars to get something that could listen to all of the frequency bands that like something like this would output and for you to actually a- access all that data. So once I got a, a device like this, I'm actually able to see the data. I can actually get turn turn that when you press that button and it sends a signal on 433 megahertz um, that I can see that data, what that binary data is. And if I send it a bunch, if I hit the button a bunch of times, then I see it over time. I see what changes, what doesn't change. And I can make assumptions because then I can compare it to another car and say, oh, wow, this beginning is always the same between these two cars. So that must mean it's this type of car. Uh, but this part here is different between the two cars. So that must mean this one specifically for this car and this other identifier is for this other car. And usually there's actually, there actually is decent security in most cars. It's called rolling codes where the code changes every time. It's kind of like, uh, 
Google Authenticator or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's um, it, it's an yeah, it's like an additional factor of authentication where the the number changes. So if I let's say there's only a thousand uh, possible IDs or passwords that would work to open this car or turn this car on, if you send ID ten, it turns on. But the next, but if I listen to that and replay it, replay that ten, it says, oh, I've already seen ten. We're on a new code now, so it's not going to allow that. So that was the first problem I ran into, where I can't send the same code. So if you go up to your car and you uh, turn it on, I can listen and I can store that. But if I replay it, it's not going to work because the car knows that that's been that code's been used. Now, is the car recognizing? Is it the uh, frequency or the tune effectively of that, like quick, 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 that type of stuff <laughs> electronically, like a bird song that is triggering the car? Therefore, if it didn't change from a ten to whatever was next, you'd be able to replay that sound auditorily uh, ha- not not with audio okay i mean so um audio is is, is essentially vibration of air right where uh this is radio frequency i see right so the audio um, is really just a cue for the human to be like exactly. oh it's my key my key did something yeah yeah it's just a really silly sound that they use yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which i like to reenact <laughs> as some of you may have noticed that will increase with the more wine that we have most likely uh <laughs> Got it. So you ran into the problem that this is this is this is a rolling code, exactly. Some type of prefix or whatever it might be that's changing over time. Right. But there's there's a couple exploits here. There's a couple possible vulnerabilities. If you're away from your car, if you're not close to it, and you hit the button, and I capture that, I can play it. So if I came into your house and I had my device and I pressed the button on your key, I could then record it because your car is far enough that it didn't see that code. Mm. So now I can use the code. Right. But that's not good enough because now I'm in your house. I have access to your key. That seems, uh, it seems like I already have physical access. I might just live here. It's a brute force. <laughs> yeah, approach. it's a brute force stack. Uh, so, uh, that's just not good enough of an exploit, really, for at least for me. So I want to take it for. It's not very elegant. It's not elegant at all. Um, so how can we make this better? Now, another thing that I've seen is that these the a lot of these devices are very inexpensive they they don't want to spend too much on these parts they want to make it work and work well um so if you actually send a bunch of other data on that frequency it will not work because now the car is confused and it sees too much information now if you st- you could call that jamming and you don't need to send a big signal but i could if you take another car with the, that communicates on the same frequency with the key and you just hold down your lock button while someone else is trying to get into their car you will prevent them from getting into their car. <laughs> oh my God. So you can actually hold, and for totally different manufacturers, most of them are using the same frequency because there are only certain frequency bands you can use oh my for God. this type of stuff. So if you see someone and you have like a, like I was using a Cadillac uh, car key and I, it, it transmits so far. If you have one of those really powerful transmitters that hits your car from far away and, and you just hold, up, and you just, just hold, hold lock. it down. Just hold locked down. So you could just sit in the parking people. garage, drinking drinking your coffee, holding yeah. down the lock button, watching people lose their shit. <laughs> not, be, not being able to turn on their cars. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> just sitting in there. <laughs> so ostensibly, is there a way, and this is just me with my, uh, my science fiction cap on, uh, or conspiracy theorist cap on perhaps, uh, is, w- is there ostensibly a way, if they're limited, if that band is so uniform... Mm-hmm that someone could deploy some type of uh, wide-reaching jamming to incapacitate cars over an extended period of time? Um, I, yes. <laughs> 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 I mean, you need a lot of power, right? The further, uh, the further you want to go, you need a lot of power. That's why, that's why FM stations, right, they have such big towers. Um, AM can actually go longer. Uh, and so uh, there are a couple ways that you can do this. Um, but yeah, you, you could, with enough power and an antenna, you could prevent a lot of cars from starting. Wow. Uh, at least if it requires, if it's using the radio frequency based stuff, right? Not, not a normal key. Normal key will work fine. And I'm sure there are people out there listening to this who are asking themselves, why on earth would these security researchers make these exploits known to the general public? You know, isn't that just giving a blueprint to be blue want to? exert malice in the world or create chaos and wh- how would you how would you respond to that oh i mean uh, that, that's a that's i'm inf- a- now keeping in mind in full disclosure i'm one of those kids who bought the anarchist cookbook and was looking at like improvised <laughs> munitions and put himself inadvertently on every watch list on the in in, in the domestic united states but uh so i'm fascinated by exploits i find them inf- infinitely 
interesting, but at the same time, you know, this is a question that comes up. So yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'll first say, well, when I was a kid, it was like twelve, and and once I was twelve, I had my own website, and I found the Anarchist Cookbook. So I put a copy of it up because I thought this was awesome. And one day, my mom comes home from like one of her jobs and is like, "Sammy, like someone at work was look, you know, found this thing on your website." And uh, he was actually looking up this thing, Anarchist Cookbook, and found it on your website. Like, why are you? Why do you have this thing? I was like, well, it's awesome, but why was he looking? <laughs> like, he had found it inadvertently, not on my site, but just through a he web, was searching through, for he it. Was searching right? for it. <laughs> it's like I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> and I mean, it, it's inf- interesting information. But you ask a good question. Uh, you ask a good question, right? Um, is this a blueprint for you know malicious people to to act upon? And it can be, <clears throat> but I don't think so. And the reason I say this is I, I've been doing, I've been in security and hacking long enough that many years ago, what I would do is I, if I found a new exploit, I would sometimes I would contact the company uh, and I would let them know about this and say, hey, like totally free, just just want to let you know I found this vulnerability. You guys should patch this because it's uh, you know bad for your customers. Your customer data could be leaked. You could be hacked. It could hurt you. Um, I haven't done anything. I just found it. And sometimes you get a response. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes they fix it. Sometimes they don't. And then I found I found some other vulnerabilities, and then I would write publicly about it and say, "Hey, like here are some things that we need to fix. This is a general problem, not something I can just email a company about." And you know, nothing would really happen. A couple of security people would read my blog and say, "Oh, neat. That's like some really interesting information. Thank you, Sammy." Nothing changes. <laughs> um, and then one day I said, "You know what? Like nothing ever changed. Uh, a lot of these things don't change when I when I talk about them. When I contact the right the proper people." Right. Who, when, who have the when, po- when you're going through official channels when I, you're going through official channels so i released this time not only a blog and this is uh there was something i released a, a few years ago and it's called the uh, ever cookie and essentially what this does is it plants a tracking cookie on your computer kind of like when you go to a website and you know if you go to google and you make a search and then you go back to google a week later it knows who you are it knows that you did that search last week and that's through a cookie but you can delete your cookies and I found that some companies were also doing, uh, they would install a different type of cookie called like a flash cookie. So that if you deleted your normal cookies, they would still know who you are. It's a bit surreptitious. Yeah, that's, that's creepy. Yeah, it's a little, a little creepy. And a, you know, a number of people knew about this for many years and it got talked about and talked about and talked about for years. And I thought, well, I mean, these aren't, you know, someone had released a little bit of software to try to prevent it. And I thought, there's some other ways of doing this. And I was in, uh, Dublin at the time, first time I left the U.S. We were talking about earlier, and I, uh, I thought it'd be cool to create something that can really plant itself, like in every possible way that I can think of. And I sat down. I was like, "There's got to be at least four or five ways." And I thought about four, about fourteen or fifteen ways to plant software, or not software, but a unique identifier that will then track you every time you come back to that website or any site that has that tries to attract you using that software. So it would, it would install a unique identifier in your cookies, in your flash cookies, in your Silverlight, in Java, in your history, in your cache, just everywhere. And if you deleted almost everything except one, it would then respawn. It would recreate everywhere. So you could never get rid of it. Literally, most browsers could not get rid of this. So if someone wanted to track you, they would always be tracking your web presence, at least on those sites that host it. And this got... Press. <laughs> this, I mean, this was interesting to the security community because the security community had been talking about this for years, but no one really listened. Uh, people had been demonstrating companies that were doing m- more mediocre measures of this. Right, university versions. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that they were going JV. And, uh, th- this was finally something that anyone could use, entirely open source. I mean, entirely free. Um, and got a lot of hate mail for. But what was interesting was it was a few months later that every browser vendor had changed. Every major browser had changed. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, when you want to delete your history, you delete it in one place. If you want to delete your cache, you have to go into a different dropdown and delete it there. If you want to delete your uh, down, recent downloads, you go somewhere else. All of this stuff was segregated. And right. no, in, no sane person would actually go to all through all this effort. Now, when you delete your privacy information, you it's all to, centralized. You go to it's file to one, privacy, one checklist, one checklist, and that's. I saw that change. That was probably the the biggest thing that made it. You know, that impacted me to understand this actually produces change. Yes, maybe someone will be able to use it maliciously for a little bit, but you know what? People have been using it maliciously for years, and no one actually knows that because talking about it doesn't do enough. 
Yeah, it's not just enough to talk. Yeah, and you need people to listen. And there are definitely different different levers you can pull to make that more effective. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so speaking of which, uh, and I, I do want to, if you're open to it, uh, chat about uh, MySpace at one point. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because that's a hell of a story. Oh, my God, folks. <laughs> Don't go away. Coming right back. Uh, the... The next subject I thought we could we could dig into a little bit is is uh, online dating. So getting people to listen. <laughs> so, uh, we had a lot of fun with the uh, the episode on the Tim Ferriss experiment, which is now digitally available. By the time people are listening to this, which is amazing after so much effort and lawyering and everything, uh, we had a lot of fun on that episode. <clears throat> and you take this same scientific approach and i really feel like what you do is uh using the scientific method really at at a high level to to attack some of these these engineering problems and challenges uh in the world of mating and dating so uh could you talk about some of the some of the ways you have thought about online dating and improved your prospects in online <laughs> sure. dating. And we, we can dig from there. <laughs> all right. So. I don't even know where to begin. My, <laughs> my mind is flooded with, with all the possibilities that we could discuss. Okay. So, so I used, um, I used online dating maybe I don't, a long time ago, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And, uh, I, I met someone great and had a great relationship for a few years and that was awesome. And, uh, I think I, I got back to it maybe, let's see, I think five or six years ago, I had, gotten my you know meeting people is frustrating uh i wanted to meet meet more women so i thought okay i'll i'll do online dating again i had good experience it was pain it was hard as a lot of work it was painful uh but also fun at times and it was successful so i thought okay i'll, I'll do it again so i went on sort of the, the hip dating site at the time and I what was made, that? Uh, that was OK Cupid. OK Cupid. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I made a profile on there a few years ago, and I started reaching out to people, uh, doing searches, and that you know I was doing a lot of I had also a lot of work. I had a lot of stuff to do in my life, a lot, a lot of stuff I liked doing. I did not like going messaging people, not getting messages back, <laughs> scrolling just like scrolling through endless lists, having so many so much data to go through. And then not even knowing whether, I, I mean, I guess the biggest problem was I wasn't getting messages back, right? I'm like, what happened? <laughs> I, I, I thought I was eligible. <laughs> what's the failure point here? Yeah. Right. And I'm like, damn it. So I thought, okay, well, you know, how would I how would I approach this? And this was after a few frustrating weeks. I thought, how would I approach this if this were a, a problem with my, let's say, my company's website or something? What if I were trying to make sales online? Um, how, how would I approach this differently? And I thought, okay, well, if I, if I were doing something for my own company or my own business or my own product or whatever, I would probably, I'd start with some basic A-B testing, some multivariate testing. Um, I would try comparing what uh, one group of people did versus another group of people. So I didn't have, uh, I didn't want to spend too much time in this, but I wrote a little script. And all that did was every day that would cycle, that would change my photo, my primary photo. And, uh, Okay, Cupid will also show you how many hits you would get that day. So every day I would check back and that would store it in a database. And, you know, I had it, I had throw up a couple of my, you know, bad photos just as a, I don't know, control or something and had my, my best photos and some medium photos. My best photos were awful. They were terrible. What I thought, oh, performance was, wise. what a performance wise, what I thought looked great <laughs> with this stupid smirk on my face it was terrible. Just bombed. It, it bombed, right? No one clicked, right? And this is in, in searches and probably in messages as well. Nobody clicked the photos that I thought were good. And a couple of these photos that I just thought were mediocre, subpar, just they got clicks. And there's certain, certain things I learned that I, I mean, I will say are. Chick crack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> things that, you know, when guys see certain things on a website, they click. <laughs> hey, their brain shuts off and they click. And I, there are the same things for girls. So what are, what are some of those things? Well, um, the thing that did best, I mean, just a landslide, was uh, a picture of me and a cat sitting on my shoulder. 
<laughs> so they weren't clicking for me, and this had nothing to do with me. I mean, let's let's be clear. It was, they yeah. saw a cat, yeah. but that's okay. I'm just trying to get you one step further, right? One step further, where then you can learn a little bit of my personality. Maybe you'll you know you'll try to read this uh, <laughs> this text I put up. Uh, so that was that. Instantly after learning that, I was just blown away. I was like, "Wow, I've been doing this wrong. I am not as uh, I have no idea what other people like." Apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's fair. I mean, I don't. So I should use data and try to help help myself and help other people. I mean, I think this is this is beneficial. <laughs> and uh, we did some absurd permutations <laughs> oh, of this <laughs> <laughs> for the TV show. I'm not going to spoil it, uh, but we uh, we went for the gold with, uh, with some of these profile pics. Uh, the of you of, uh, you. of me clear. of me of me to be clear. <laughs> and there were other people involved, like Neil Strauss, who <laughs> really was not in favor of of any of this. But uh, he was the author of the game. For those people who don't know, the the what are what are some of the now at one point you cr- didn't you create a female profile to observe what came in as inbound in terms of absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll start with this. I'm I'm not. Um, I try to be as transparent and and honest with people. Um, I you know I hate deception and I don't try to deceive people. But for A/B testing, it's 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 for science. Mm-hmm. So I created a profile of uh, uh, of what I thought would be someone I would like to date, right? Someone who's attractive. Um, what did you picture- What did you call her? Do you remember? Ooh, I, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm pretty no sure problem. I stole. I'm pretty sure I stole another girl's username and then you know, changed a number. Got it. Um, I used text from a profile that I really liked. I used a friend's pictures who allowed me to and. Uh, I put that up just to see what, if I were a female that you know, I personally would be attracted to, what are they experiencing on an online dating site? Because I have no idea. Um, I thought my witty messages would, would really work and they weren't. So, you know, I'd, I'd always start with the subject hello and then a really great message. And, uh, after the first day I got over, uh, no, close to a hundred messages, close to a hundred emails. As this, you know, attractive, interesting female. That's, I mean, terrible. There's no possible way anyone's going to go through all those messages. And now I'm looking at the messages. And the first thing I see is the same subject over and over and over (laughs) that I probably used over and over and over. They're all saying basically four things, three or four things. Um, Hello. (laughs) <laughs> that's that yours my line yeah that's my line <laughs> you know hey wink winky face um <laughs> thought we should chat <laughs> and uh wanna fuck nice it's a strong it's a strong opener and it's actually all of those were used a lot it was, it was surprising and <laughs> I, I felt I was I was offended. <laughs> As a fake female on this website, I was offended, <laughs> and I thought, "Wow, like these are all the a hey, they're all the same, right? Even if it were interesting, if it's all the same, then it's irrelevant." So I immediately learned, okay, my subject line has to be different. It has to be interesting. It has to be you know non offensive, and it has to be not boring. Um, so then I went into another city. I went into actually another state, and I tried mailing lots of people different subject lines as a man right yeah. as my own profile in a state that i wasn't even in i'm not actually going to meet these people i'm sorry if i emailed you but i just wanted to know what subjects had the best read rate and then response rate um i found a little exploit that allowed me to get the read rate because normally you can't see how many people open your message right once i found this i found how many people open a message and then i can also track how many people uh, responded Right. And that uh, the open rate allows me to measure how well, how good is the subject doing the subject line. And I tested a ton of different subject lines to see what worked best. And, uh, I'm sorry to say it. Uh, and I've been trying to curse less, but the best subject line was fuck you. (laughs) Now I'm not saying that, that, that obviously not elicit a positive emotional response, but that's not immediately the goal. That's not immediately the goal. And and that's okay because, <laughs> and I found if you're still a dick in the email, the response rate is zero <laughs> or, or very little and, and some mean things. And I don't think you should ever be mean to someone. And my intent, again, is not to be mean. I was, I'm trying to see. It's like clapping in front of their face. <laughs> <How> <laughs> really, really hard. Open this. <laughs> and I found the best, res- the best 
way to get a response and a positive response is to say, I only did that so you'd read this message. Mm -hmm. You're probably getting a ton of emails from other guys that are saying, hey, or want to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> And she's like, how did he know? Exactly. How did he know? Exactly. So, so it's really, I mean, it's just trying to understand what someone else is going through and how can I, how can I maneuver that better? And then also, ultimately, I'm always transparent. You know, whenever I meet anyone, I tell them, I, whenever I meet anyone, I tell them, uh, you know, exactly all the, all the tactics just because, I mean, if anything else, it's interesting conversation, especially yeah. with a woman. Yeah. Um, it really, it, it was the best first date every time. You just get to talk about something like immediately you have something to talk about. You're both on this dating site. You're both trying to meet somebody and you're both upset about the results. <laughs> how, how inefficient the whole thing is. So immediately that, that was always really positive. Uh, so yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you be an asshole, I'm, but I am suggesting that uh, it, it's good to learn about ways to, you know, just yeah, maneuver past and, and actually get someone to read you, read that letter and, and see whether you are an interesting person, whether you would jive. You know, with, uh, with online dating, for someone who does not have technical chops, so, so for sure. someone who cannot personally, doesn't have the capacity to write scripts or whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, what would your advice to them be in this day and age? That's great. Okay. Uh, because there's, there's a wide variety of toolkits available, right? You have the OKCupids, the Match.coms, Tinder, oh, sure. of course. Uh, what would your advice to, to a non-technical person be? And let's assume for the, for, for the sake of argument that since they would waste, as a guy, you're going to waste hundreds of dollars on drinks and dinners that go nowhere. Mm -hmm. So let's assume they have a budget. Okay. A little bit of a budget, okay. like 500 bucks. Okay. What would your advice to them be? <laughs> okay. So uh, the, the first thing you do is you get a record player and you take, uh, you take your iPhone and you attach one of those, um, what, what, those, those pens that have the conductive tip so you can draw on your iPhone with it. Mm -hmm. And you attach it to the record player and you put Tinder beneath it. So the record player just spins and <laughs> just checks, you know, how you just swipe swipes, right? to swipe over and over. I saw a video of this and it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> just someone who attached this little nub to a record player that would just swipe on twin Tinder. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> uh, okay. No. So re realistically, uh, you know, the, I don't know, the site might not be around anymore, but, um, Instead of writing a program, you could use a site like Hot or Not, or if there are, if there are any uh, sites like that that you know unfortunately measure appearance. But that's important. It's very important. Your photo is the most I learned. Or okay, Cupid, most critical, which allows you to upload the photos to do uh, my Cupid or my best face. Oh right, they have that now. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, my best. You're right. My best face on OK Cupid allows you to essentially do the same thing, where you can upload a number of photos. You rate other people's photos, essentially, and other people rate yours. So it's a, it's a really cool system where you learn what, you know, what of photos of you are most attractive. And I found the photo of Brad Pitt was my most attractive photo. <laughs> <laughs> right. The picture of, uh, my picture of uh, Jason Statham with s just doing a Scrooge McDuck backstroke in a pool of money was... Uh, <laughs> was surrounded by kittens. <laughs> yeah, right. Surrounded by penguins. I don't know about penguins. why the penguins work so well. That's true. Uh, <laughs> So first identify which photos work the best for the, you. The photo is the first thing anyone sees. Um, and we did this in the episode too. So, so for people who want to see how off I was, how incredibly <laughs> off I was in my predictions, uh, you, you can check that out. It's on iTunes probably at this point. But uh, so you identify your best photos. Absolutely. What's next? Okay. So now... If you if you're any like if you're like me and had a terrible photo, you're now receiving messages. So you're already you're already like happy, um, but it, that's not enough. You need to because you know you're you need to be a little bit more selective. Um, so what's next is I would say testing different subject lines. Um, you know I I wanted to test so many people that I went to a different state, and I automated that. But you can you can test it yourself, right? You can use the same message, and some of these services allow you to pay a little extra um, to see read rates and open rates and uh, essentially analytics for your dating profile. Uh, pay pay that extra amount and make changes. Make changes often and record that data. Always record it. Keep it in an Excel spreadsheet. You will learn so much. Um, so the next thing is how do you communicate? Um, 
the this is just the way it is. If you're a guy, you need to be reaching out to people, right? And you should be. <laughs> Yeah, if you haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> the hot chicks are not going to come knocking on your door. I hate to tell you. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be selective, you need to work for it. So, <laughs> so um, testing different subject lines. And uh, another thing that I learned that, that you should use immediately is while messages are great, uh, what I found was very was really, really effective is you could go messaging for weeks with someone who's really interesting. And... If you're, if the service you're using, uh, has chat, like, okay, Cupid has chat, chat, you know, s- select people as your favorite. So you see them whenever they're online. Um, don't stalk them. Just like when you see them once, then talk to them, communicate with them. And what's uh, a good opener, uh, in your experience, uh, I, I, I try to make it relevant to their profile, right? You, you, you don't want to appear like you don't want, you don't want to be the people who don't actually read the text, right? You actually want to learn about that person, Right there's a high probability she's looking for someone who has read the text <laughs> who has read her profile, right? She put in time on that. You put in time on that. So read it. Um, don't, you know, if you're just, you might find, you might not like this person. <laughs> <laughs> so read the text and then try to, you know, try to make some simple conversation. I would say immediately. The best thing I learned is it's not even about the opener at this point because you're chatting. So where a message, the subject line is so critical because if it's not good enough, She's not going to open it. In a chat, the chat's open. You can get a couple lines of text before she closes, <laughs> closes it and says, I'm not, I'm not listening to this. A little bit mar- more margin for error. Exactly. And I find the chats are always read, right? If you're saying something in chat, it's always read. Do not sit around and talk and just wait for them to respond to everything. Instead, have an interesting story. It should be a legitimate story in your life, but everyone has, everyone has something. And if you don't, I mean, go and talk about your life more, but find an interesting story in your life or do something interesting or do something. Absolutely. <laughs> go, you know, go. If you don't have at least one good story, yeah. you need to get outside more. You need to go <laughs> running naked in the quad. Okay. <laughs> so have a short but sweet story prepared, you know, a true story about your life and just dish it. Start talking. Who cares? Who cares what the other person thinks right now? Because they're probably not going to respond anyway, right? <laughs> if you're if you're listening and and you care about this, this is probably because it hasn't been working. So try this. <laughs> so I'm, I have to ask, and feel free to to uh, to reject this question. But okay. what was what was your go to story? Oh, uh, go to story. Okay. Um, uh, okay. I think I think we may have done something similar. Um, was it on point tactical? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, with Kevin Reeve. Yes. So I had recently done this uh, urban escape and evasion class that it sounds like if you have taken and are an expert in. <laughs> I'm well, sure you've done a well, lot. I'm a amateur. Yeah, yeah. I'm no, like a no, I'm no. like a green belt. You you've actually you've done more things than I learned I learned when I went to him. So uh, he he's he's up up the game and and that's really cool. I'm gonna ask you some questions later. Um, <laughs> But I, I took this, this course, Urban Escape and Evasion, three days in L.A. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned, I mean, the, he taught me how to escape out of LAPD handcuffs, right? Get out of riot flexi cuffs. Um, you know, I, at my time when I went, uh, he did not, we didn't learn about the newer cars. We learned about older cars. So I was stuck in like a 70, you know, 75 Hyundai. So, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that I stole. Um, and that was, I mean, the fact that on the, on the third day of this class, you know, we got, I got picked up in a van and a, they, they put a hood over my head. Uh, it was strange because it's kind of like the, the eco friendly, the green, environmentally friendly type <laughs> of like, of like, they, 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 bag. they put like a Whole Foods bag over <laughs> <Exactly>. your head. Exactly. <laughs> it was exactly that. So they put like a whole green Whole Foods bag over my head so I couldn't see. They took my wallet and phone and, and drove around LA and I had to get out. I had to escape from the handcuffs and run around Los Angeles without money. Uh, <laughs> and I would tell some tidbits of the story about, you know, how I. Now, this is all in chat. All in chat. So, so is it like, hey, what's up? And then you're like, let me tell you about the time I got, got out of LAP, PD handcuffs. Uh, usually what's the, the transition? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> no, I'm like, I'm so into the specifics because when it comes to all of this, sure. I remain to this day a complete, like, I, I three finger monkey fumble all of this stuff. I'm <laughs> such a fucking idiot. So I'm really interested in the specifics. Okay. All sure. Right. Sure. So, so I say, hey, 
what do you do today? Yeah. That's, that's pretty much the, that's pretty much how I would start that conversation. Yeah. What did you do today? Not what do you do? No, no one cares. This is not, it's not an interview, right? <laughs> what did you do today? Uh, if, you know, she's either going to say something interesting and you can add on that or, or you're too afraid to comment on what she said or she's not saying much. She's saying, went to work, right? Went to school, uh, you know, did nothing. Watch him <laughs> not much, watch LOL, him watch winky face. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I tried that. That didn't work well. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> when, I, when I answered that. <laughs> so, okay. So you ask, what did you well, do What today? did you do today? Um, you're saying, you know, she's saying something, she's saying something. Often it's, it's irrelevant. Often it's the same thing that everyone else says, right? He, as a guy, you're also receiving a lot of the same thing too. Um, so as a girl, you know, if you really care, then also, you know, pay attention to be different, be different if you can, uh, be, and you know, interesting because you probably are. <laughs> so show that. Uh, so what did you do today? And then maybe they'll ask, what did you do? And if they don't, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> you can still say, uh, because at this point, if she didn't ask, she's not interested. She only will, she's already not interested. It can only go up from here. Right. This is, there's the only upside. <laughs> exactly. And if she asks, then she asks. So answer. And I said, you know, oh, well, just recently this happened. Um, and if it's six months ago, fib say just recently this happened. And, and that's, that's the transition. Got it. I say like got it. last weekend. Uh, or yeah, you know, I've just been going over this crazy class that, that I took. Cool. Definitely. And, and talk a little bit, right? Do, do more talking, um, offer some, something interesting. So we've never talked about this, but I, I, I will ask anyway, uh, the jump to in real life to IRL quick, quick, so, quick. All right. Quick, quick. Tell me more. Every time I, and do how this- do you, and what's, What's the verbiage? What's the, sure, what's sure. the transition? Okay. So every time I would have like emails, messages go back and forth, it would be great because the emails you actually get, you know, you get good information back. And if you're doing back and forth emails, you're actually communicating a lot. And a lot of people are, uh, I mean, I think it's not so much anymore, right? I started, you know, I was, I did online dating maybe three times in my life and, um, it was all great. Like it actually was successful every time. And, and I'm glad, I'm glad I always did it. And back then, I mean, when I first started, I was 18, I'm like 29 now. So it was 11 years ago. And, uh, people were more fearful of meeting someone on the internet, right? That, that was a little different. It was different back then, right? You didn't use your full name. Yeah. It's not until Facebook came out that people use their full name because they had to, <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't want to miss out on the social network. I mean, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, so, I'm sorry. What was the question? The, the, the <laughs> jump to oh, in jump, real life, the jump to IRL. IRL. Okay. So what I learned was messaging back and forth was comfortable and it actually made it more difficult to jump into a meeting on chat. You've quickly communicated. If you had an interesting story, you've quickly communicated that you have interesting things to talk about. You're, you know, confident enough to talk about it. You at least, if you have other stories like this, you're probably an interesting person. I mean, you're, you're probably already are an interesting person. Um, and after about five minutes and don't, don't linger, don't wait till the conversation dies down. Um, there's a Seinfeld episode where I think George Casanza found that it was best when he left at the top, at the height. <laughs> <laughs> just like the Rocky Marciano approach to dating. He's like, all right, that was my best joke, and I got to go. And I'm out. Exactly, right? Because if you let it linger, then it's just boring. You're just remembering the, how it ended. Well, make it end good. Right? You just had this awesome story. She's at the, you know, the edge of her seat, and she's like, oh, wow, that's, like, that's really cool. That's really interesting. It's like, hey, you know, I have to run. I have to go do some other interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go rescue some kittens down the street. <laughs> from some penguins. <laughs> right, right, yeah, exactly. And uh, but from there, you say, you know, I have to run right now. Um, you know, get some information because you don't want to meet someone just because they said, LOL, smiley face, right? <laughs> you, you also, they need to feel like they've, they've earned that value as well. Like, right. no one wants to. I don't like it when someone comes up and just offers me a bunch of stuff for no reason. Like, yeah. what do you want from me? Right. Right. You want something from me. So that's just try to think in their position, try to put yourself like reverse the role. And what would happen if that happened to you? Mm-hmm. Um, so I conversate a little bit more, try to you know learn some interesting things about them, ask them questions that are not common and you can learn some questions from the emails, right? If you, if you create a fake profile in another state, don't respond to people. I think that's deceptive. Just, 
let emails come in, right? And see what people say and learn from those because you'll see the same, the common questions, the questions that you think are really unique that everyone else is asking. <laughs> Don't ever ask those. Um, you'll learn those over time. Instead, try to think of something different. Um, and I didn't, I thought I was being unique, but I was asking the same. Are there any unique questions that you relied on consistently? Uh, I mean, uh, you, I would say I would just ask about thing, things that I actually wanted to know. Like I wanted to know, would you rather lose your front teeth or cut off your thumbs? Would you ask some questions like that? <laughs> no, <laughs> no I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. No, no. That's such like nothing, a, nothing that's, that, that, that's a dude wine type question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Probably not appropriate for online dating. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just asked them like, like how was your day? Not, not what did you do today? Or like, what was the most, I mean, uh, implore them to give you the interesting information about your life, about their life. What is the most interesting thing that happened to you in the last week? Yeah. And now they're going to recall and refeel, like have the same emotions that they felt at that most interesting time of their life in right. the last week. <laughs> yeah. Got it. So I have to go to do this other interesting thing. And then what? Uh, so I have to go, I have to go and do X. Um, make a joke if you can <laughs> to go save some yeah. penguins. Yeah. That's, that's funny, right? Yeah. I, I think that's funny. Um, maybe it's not, right? Yeah. <laughs> A-B test that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, let's, let's grab a quick coffee this week. Uh, you know, I, I did dinners a few times and I quickly ran it, ran into having, uh, dinners with a bunch of people I really didn't want to have dinner with. Yeah. It's a one to three hour plus for the <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. So Coffee's then it's coffee. It's coffee. It's, you know, it's easy to, easy to leave. It's quick. Um, you don't, you don't have to, uh, it's not a big deal if you pay for it, right? You're not setting any stage or anything. You can pay for it and be nice and, it's not a big, you know, it's not a big event. <laughs> what, uh, if, if those, some people listening to this almost certainly of the male variety, um, but not definitely. Hello ladies. I know you're listening to, but let, just try to go out and hit on guys for a day and you will see how brutal that side <laughs> of the game is. It's fucking terrible. Uh, let's just assume that, there are guys listening to this, maybe women, could be either, and they're saying, you know, I need a Sammy. I need someone to help me automate this, mm. to swipe right on all these profiles, to automatically <laughs> like all these people, to simplify this process, because dating online seems to be a sort of high-volume, low-yield proposition. I want to stack the deck. Uh, how would they find someone to help? What would they look for? ask for sure sure I, I mean i don't know of any because i haven't used any but i would look specifically for dating services that use analytics um if you like to play with this kind of stuff if you like to you know if you like to be analytical or if you like to see how you can stack the deck yourself if you think playing cards is interesting uh use existing dating services like okcupid or match and pay for their pay for their additional software their 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 their, their upgrades, premium services their premium services are now if you wanted to find say a freelancer a programmer uh what are the qualifications that someone would look for if you're like okay i want you to write a script to say hypothetically if i if i live in um, uh, yeah chicago i want to auto like everyone in chicago <laughs> who fits the following specifications but i don't know how to do that because i'm not a techie uh who would I look to hire? Like if I went to Elance or one of the, yeah. the one of these sites, uh, what would my sort of project request look okay. like? Uh, I mean, there's two things I'll say to that. The the first thing I'll get quickly out of the way, uh, you it's that always seems like the best idea, and that's what I want to do. I want to get as many people. I want to cast the widest net as possible. And until you do it, you think it's a great <laughs> idea. And uh, I would tell you not to, but you're going to. So. <clears throat> do it <laughs> learn that you're then spending all your time with people you don't care about right so then you actually have to spend time filtering and i spent the next half of my <laughs> that time filtering but to answer your question because i understand like if someone told me not to i still would <laughs> so to get that need out you have to sometimes um i would look for somebody uh i'd go on elance i'd go on craigslist i would try to find uh, someone who's developed software who can develop web crawlers um, who can develop backend web software and who can develop, you know, maybe basic analytics software. You don't need, you know, they don't need to be a genius. This is, this is very simple stuff that you're doing pr programmatically. Got yeah. it. Uh, if you were using, do you, I'm not, I don't even, uh, 
if you were on Tinder, hypothetically or otherwise, mm-hmm. uh, does any of the advice change? Hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't, yeah, I don't use Tinder. I'm not on Facebook. Um, but if I were to use Tinder, uh, what would I do? Let's see. Well, I mean, I've uh, lately I've been playing around with computer vision algorithms. So, <laughs> uh, computer vision that lets you actually see, uh, you know, lets you may make a computer actually see things and interpret things. But on Tinder, I mean, meaning I mean, I mean, meaning that you it. could have the computer decide hot or not for you, for you <laughs> well, after I, putting I, adding in some inputs. I, I think you could you could do some. <laughs> I, I guess yes. The, the the answer is yes. You can do some basic things there, uh, but I think what I'd want to do is: uh, Does Tinder have descriptions of people? I'm not sure. They're very short descriptions. Short descriptions. So the thing you want is a data set, right? You want to know who are the people, and maybe you have you know maybe you have girlfriends uh, who are on Tinder. Like look them up. Look up their information. Look up anything that would help provide information to people who you think you would like to date and people who you think you would not like to date because you need to be able to have uh, information on both so you can write some sort of algorithm. Um, because Tinder has such little information, I would say, you know, for a friend I wrote actually a Tinder script that would essentially swipe until I saw that video. And that video was just, it was hilarious. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to just swipe, you can use a record player. And uh, one of those <laughs> nubs, <laughs> iPhone nubs, to swipe for you. Um, but then after that, it's I believe it's chatting. Is that right? Yeah, it's all chatting. Okay, so most applications on mobile, uh, iPhone, Android, they're actually web based. So you're actually dealing with a lot of the same web software um, or, or web uh, protocols. So you, if you wanted to automate some of that, man, I guess what I would personally do if I were on there, I would create or hire someone to create a bot that would swipe yes swipe correct yes i want to communicate with this person and when we were matched up then i would have it automatically communicate and then i would have it text me and i could probably (laughs) what i might do is actually automate a few like have a story or two that i could text back to this device so wherever i wherever i was like if i was on is if I was on a date, if I were on a date, mm-hmm. I would be able to text back and say, turn this story on. <laughs> and it would just communicate with someone. Right. Go on <laughs> Go point on. tactical. <laughs> right. But you would still see the messages. So you could still actually communicate with that person live from your phone. Right. right? You might not be, or I guess you could open the app at that point. But yes, I would, again, find the same type of person. Someone who can create web software, not just a website, but a web crawler. I think that's the that's the differentiation. Someone who knows how to sort of crawl and automate, right? Produce something that's autonomous that can communicate with this website, with this app. Hmm. How would you vet the people who respond? So if you go to say a Craigslist or uh, an Odesk or an Elans, and you put up looking for web crawler specialist for dating project. And yeah. you describe roughly what you're trying to accomplish. So you get 37 responses from people who are saying, mm-hmm. I can do this. Yeah, no problem. Is there something that you could have them do as a test mm. to assess their competency? Uh, um, I would ask them, I would find a website that you like, um, maybe you know a news website or something, and I would, something that has other content on it, and I would say, write me a script, or don't write me a script, you know, if you can do this quickly, I will hire you. Please have it go to every news article for the last week, right? Something that has to hit click back, right? And take these elements of the page, take the, the, sub, the headline, um, and take the fifth word and put those in an XML document. Something that clearly is not that valuable make make it not valuable right you don't want them to work too hard you don't want to abuse their time and you don't want to suck value from them right if someone i would not want to do free work for someone but if it's a test that they clearly get no value out of i'm more likely to do that so i'd say something that you can't actually use that doesn't that's interesting that's interesting so it's not even a time issue it's really a utility question yeah i feel like if someone you know if i'm working with someone i'd right if i were asking for something that gave me a real roi you'd be less inclined to do it but if i'm saying hey this is just a test of your competency you know i can't use the output 
Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm happy to demonstrate that of my capabilities. I'm not happy to provide free services, free, uh, I'll, right? I'll, value yeah. in, in exchange for nothing. Correct. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's really interesting. I've never thought about that before. Uh, very cool. So, uh, two things. I think we should definitely talk about MySpace. Okay. And it looks like we've we've temporarily run out of wine. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, pause this for just one moment, and we shall be back. Don't go away. We are back after a bathroom break and an alcohol refill with Sammy. Sammy, how the hell are you? I'm great. <laughs> and I, I promised to find people at home that we talk about MySpace. And uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't even know where how to introduce this story. <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about your involvement with MySpace. Okay. <laughs> so my involvement, I'm, I was a user <laughs> of MySpace. Um, so back in the day, this was, this was probably, this was 10 years ago. So I was 19 at the time. Uh, and MySpace, this was 2005. MySpace was the number one site on the internet. Number one above Google, above anything else. And I thought this was interesting. This is kind of cool. Um, all of my friends used it. Pretty much everyone I, you know, yeah, pretty much all my friends used it. And I hadn't used it yet. Um, and I thought, okay, you know, everyone's using it. I should get on here just see, like, see what it's about, right? A little social proof and ch- check it out. And I created a MySpace, added a couple of friends, uh, made a profile. I was like, this is kind of cool. And I'd like started uploading photos. I, I finally had a digital camera and I took a bunch of fo- random photos of my friends and would post them. And once I uploaded the 12th photo and I tried to upload the 13th, it said, you have hit our limit. Now, today, today, that's insane. That's insanity. If a website told you, if Instagram said, oh, 12 photos, you've hit our max, you'd, no one would use it. Yeah, you'd be gone. Right. But back then, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't relevant. Uh, not that many people had that many photos. I mean, digital cameras were getting cheaper. And, um, but for, for the most part, that wasn't an issue. And I thought it was an issue. So I said, okay, well, how do I get around this? I don't like having 12 photos. I want, I want 14. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a solid number. <laughs> um, and I found a way to upload a 13th photo. <laughs> so I uploaded a 13th and it wasn't a big deal. It's just, I wanted to, I didn't like the limitation. Um, so I went around it and, uh, on the, the front page you have, um, you know, sort of description of yourself, like your bio, your relationship status, uh, your favorite books and stuff. And I thought, okay, well, it'd be cool to, to change. Um, there's the relationship status and, uh, I was dating someone. And so I had in a relationship and that was a drop down. You could choose from like single, divorced, married, etc. And I thought it'd be funny if I could change that to in a hot relationship, <laughs> subtle change. But if someone saw it, that'd be funny. Um, they might think it's interesting or funny. Uh, at least I do. And they wouldn't let me do that. So I thought, I wonder how I could get around this. <laughs> so I played around on the website. You know, how, I, how old were you at the time? I was, I was 19. 19. Um, <laughs> it was my sec- second year of my company. Um, so I was working full time uh, in LA. What did your company do? Uh, my company uh, did and still does uh, phone systems. So cloud-based, actually now it's cloud-based phone systems, but we started a voice over IP company uh, called Finality about, wow, 11, 12 years ago now. <laughs> That's like 700 internet years ago. That was so many mm-hmm. internet years and cats ago. <laughs> so you were 19. Yeah, I was 19. And I, I would work sort of night and day. So I'd actually you know, go to work, go to the office, come back at night and I'd play around in this MySpace site. Cause that was the cool thing at the time. That was the hip thing. So I was messing around on the site and I finally found a way that I could execute JavaScript and JavaScript is a web coding language. And, um, JavaScript allowed me to modify the page. So MySpace never allowed you to in- insert JavaScript, but I found a vulnerability within the MySpace filters and within web browsers that allowed me to inject JavaScript. And this allowed me to just modify the page more than you'd be able to. Um, unfortunately, MySpace gave a lot of uh, creative freedom uh, back then. So you could actually make the page look really ugly, but not do things like change the relationship status like I wanted. So once I figured out I could do this, I actually realized this this exploit I found is actually extremely powerful. I can actually do a lot more. 
I can make the user do virtually anything in the web browser uh, without their consent. I could, I could, in fact, steal their bank details. I have no interest in their bank details, but I could take their bank, you know, their bank details and have a bunch of people's bank information. So what I found was that whenever someone visited my profile, I could make it say in a hot relationship. And I was like, that's cool. What else can I do? And I played around further and further. And finally I realized, well, I can actually, since I can control their browser, I can make them add me as a friend. It's kind of funny. So if someone visits my profile and they're not yet my friend, they just add me. So that's, that's, you know, it's just cute. I'm just playing around on here. It's a social network. Um, and I thought, well, the next day I had like one new friend. I was like, well, that's not that cool. Like what else can I do? And there's different, uh, there's different sections. For example, your favorite books, movies, TV, heroes. And <clears throat> I thought it'd be funny if I added something. Uh, and there was this hero section. Most people didn't use it, but some people did. And you could list your favorite heroes. So someone <laughs> might have like, you know, uh, Buddha and Tim Ferriss. <laughs> <laughs> Some people might not. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I found a way that when someone would visit my profile, not only would they add me as a friend, but they would add me as a hero and it wouldn't delete their existing heroes. So if their heroes said, you know, my mom, my dad, and my grandma and Sammy, <laughs> it would add, it would append to the end. <laughs> My mom, my dad, and grandma, but most of all, Sammy is my hero. <laughs> they would append that to their hero section. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> I thought, you know, this would happen to a couple people and, you know, I'd show off to my nerd friends and <laughs> yeah. we'd get a laugh and that was that. And the next day, you know, I had so few friends on there that one person had hit it and one person had this. I was like, man, how do I make this go a little faster? I just want to show a few friends like, hey, I made 10 people say this um, on their profile. So I thought, okay, well, if I can make someone add me as a friend and I can make them add me as a hero, well, the code's on my profile. I could probably make them add the code to their profile. So, Tim, if you visited my profile, you would add me as a friend and add me as a hero, but you'd also add the code to your profile. If then someone visited your profile, they would add me as a friend, add me as a hero, and also the code would go onto their profile. So it became a worm. Uh, I believe that's like the technical definition of a worm or virus. And it's not a big Are deal. Are worms and viruses different? Ah, oh, man, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure what the technical difference is. Um, I think usually when they're, when they're referred to, at least online, that I see, you know, viruses or viri are usually referred to when they're kind of malicious and destructive and worms are, they just spread really quickly and not necessarily... With malicious intent. Not necessarily with malicious intent, but... I guess there aren't too many, <laughs> too many things out there that spread without malicious intent. <laughs> Not to interrupt, though. So, so all right. So you're like, hey, let me make this move a little faster. Yeah. So I made it move a little faster, and I figured, okay, in a month, maybe I'll have like 50, 50 new friends and heroes, and someone will complain, right? Someone unintended will hit it and complain, and they'll my staples will remove it. That sounds not like a big deal. And I put it up. I put this this worm on my on my profile and i woke up and thought i'd have like probably four new friends um and i had 200 <laughs> and i said oh shit <laughs> <laughs> and an hour later i had another 200 and i said oh no because after eight hours it was 200 but it was exponential so it's at first i thought it was oh like gonna be a thousand in a day after i saw the 200 but no it's exponential an hour later, I had another 400. An hour later, another 800. These are people who have, A, add me as a friend, and then B, add Sammy's my hero to their profile. <laughs> <laughs> and then the worm spreads to them. And, you know, it, it wasn't malicious, right? There's no malicious intent. It's clearly a prank gone wrong. Uh, and I didn't know what to do. So immediately I emailed MySpace anonymously. And I said, hey, something weird just happened to my profile. Someone just added me. Their name is Sammy. And it says Sammy is my hero. And I found this weird piece of code that's on my profile. And it seems to do this detailed explanation of exactly what this crazy big piece of code is doing. <laughs> I'm no professional, but here's my, my this, this slice of code appears to be doing the following 17 things. If I took this, yeah, if I had to make an assumption about this obfuscated <laughs> piece of worm, um, and I think you can fix it most easily and efficiently by doing this one simple change. This is what I'd suggest. 
one simple change to stop it in its tracks. I don't know if it ever got to anyone. I have no idea to this day. Um, an hour later went by, it doubled. And I figure at some point it's going to stop, right? At some point you're going to hit, you know, you're going to hit a, a maximum because there are only so many people on MySpace, right. right? You can't get it twice. You can't get the cold twice at the same time, right? So you're going to hit a max and that's going to be that. So at about a thousand, I think it was going to max out. And I get to work and it's 2000 <laughs> and I'm just refreshing and I'm like, man, okay, I should at least de delete my profile. It's like, man, I should delete the worm. So I immediately delete the worm, but like a cold, you might be cured, but you spread it. It doesn't matter. All these other people now have it and you can't stop that. Um, for a moment I thought, okay, maybe I should like write another worm that then go transmits to all these people and then deletes the first one. I thought I shouldn't write two worms in like a 24 hour period. <laughs> that's not, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, so I just kind of waited around and I, I did send that anonymous email. I tried to get it to stop. There's not, not much I could do at that point. Uh, I did wait, wait more, you know, jumped to 2000 and then 4,000 and 8,000. So now there's 8,000 people that says Sammy is my hero on their profile. And now I'm getting messages from people. Because they're deleting me. They're like, uh, who's the Sammy guy who's on my profile? So they delete me. Which, when you delete a profile on MySpace, it immediately takes you back to your profile, where the code is, which yeah. re-executes <laughs> and re-adds me. <laughs> they must have loved that. And that was an accident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but, I mean, in software, you call it by you know, a feature when you, when you have a nice accident like that. <laughs> so you can't delete it, really. And it's spreading further and further and further. And I don't know what to do. I'm just a 19 year old kid trying to <laughs> build some software at a VoIP company and voice over IP. And, uh, it just kept going and I decided, okay, I'm going to have, I called my girlfriend at the time. I said, Hey, let's have a lunch. It's like, what's wrong? <laughs> 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 I was like, uh, I just want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so we had lunch and I said, uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but, um, uh, this worm thing. <laughs> happen on MySpace and it's been growing pretty quick. Um, and also there's this company called Fox that had purchased MySpace maybe two months prior for over half a billion dollars. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if, you know, Mr. Murdoch was very happy about this, uh, in his brand new company. So I had lunch with my girlfriend and I went back to work and now it's probably 40,000 people, 40,000 people infected with this. And I'm just like, MySpace, please stop. So I'm like, okay, at least let me delete my profile. So my just picture is gone. And I delete it. And it says, are you sure you want to delete your profile? I was like, yes. It's like, are you absolutely sure you cannot undo this? I was like, yes. It's like, okay, we are deleting your profile in 24 hours. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> what? So now all these people are still, the profile's still fully up. I can't do anything about it. It's locked now <laughs> and online. I say, okay, I just have to wait it out. Literally wait it out. So I just sit through the day, can't really do much, can't really think clearly. And by, uh, by the time work is done, um, like it's probably time to go home. I have, I don't know, half a million followers on MySpace now that all say same as my hero. And I go home and before I go home, like it's probably my last meal. So I go to Chipotle, have a burrito. <laughs> this could be my last like delicious dinner. And I drive home. And I drive home, I open the browser, 900,000. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even know there were this many people on MySpace. This is insane. At this point, uh, I refresh, and now I'm just purely interested in how quickly is it growing. So I'm now refreshing every second. I was like, I'll take a snapshot every second. But browsers didn't load that fast back then, so I take a snapshot every three seconds. And it was going two or 3,000 people per second. <laughs> that fast. <laughs> I mean, it was insanity. Uh, and it hit a million. I took a screenshot. <laughs> Just say, okay, cool. <laughs> Still scared. Don't know what to do. I, I have nothing to do. I, I mean, it, there's no way to stop this. I made a, you know, I made a horrible mistake. I created a monster. <laughs> I created a monster, yes. Uh, and at about a million, you know, 50,000, I refresh my profile and says, this profile has been taken down. And I say, hallelujah, it's gone, it's down. They took it down, thank you. And uh, I was like, I wonder what happened to the profiles that also said Sammy's my hero. I wonder if they removed it. 
So I go to another profile. It says, this profile has been taken down temporarily. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, Uh-oh. No. <laughs> so I go to myspace.com. The site is down. The whole team here is here working on it. That's what it said. The t- number one website on the internet in 2005. <clears throat> And I felt bad. I felt, I felt awful. Because A, I know what it's like to have a website, a company that's down. I know what that's like. It's awful. It's an awful feeling, an emotion that I would never want to put onto someone else. And I had done that inadvertently. Um, so immediately I'm like, I need to bring coffee and donuts to these people. Because they're in LA. I'm in LA. I'm like, maybe I shouldn't go there. and just <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't go there right now. <laughs> um, I don't know if security is going to tackle me or what. But I can't. So I just sat around. And a day went by and a week went by. And I thought, okay, I have, I have two options. Maybe I can, you know, uh, I, I mean, I can talk about this or not. And I didn't really say much about it. And someone emailed me and said, hey, like, I saw this thing on MySpace. Is this, did you make this? And I couldn't really hide because, A, I wasn't trying to be anonymous. It was a prank that had gone horribly wrong. And uh, I said, sure. And I did a little interview and... I did an interview for a couple different web thing, you know, little websites. And someone was like, Hey, you want to do an interview for our, for our site? And I was like, sure. Like, who's it for? And like wired. And I was like, Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I've heard of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I never heard from MySpace. Um, and a week went by and two weeks went by and someone asked, Hey, you know, people are selling shirts that say Sammy's my hero. <laughs> I'm like, that is awesome. I'm like, you know, are you making money off that? Like, no, but that's okay. (laughs) That's acceptable. (laughs) Uh, Good in my book. (laughs) And a month goes by, two months, three months go by, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. I'm, you know, I have a company. Feeling free in the clear. I'm feeling free. I'm feeling great. Like, never doing that again. Um, And uh, six months go by, and I said, you know, I just bought a new car and um, company was doing well. And at this point, I, I walked down to my car. I'm going to drive to work today. It's six months later from the, from the worm. And there's two guys standing next to my car. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm getting carjacked. <laughs> and I walk up to them. And they're like, Sammy? They say my name. Sammy? And I said, no, carjackers don't know your name. <laughs> and two guys this walk up behind very me. very well-educated carjackers. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not on my license plate. <laughs> and two other guys come up behind me. I say, Sammy, we have, a, we have a search warrant for you. And I'm like, what? And they all show me badges. And one shows me Secret Service. One shows me Electronics Crimes Task Force. Another shows me uh, District Attorney, LADA. Uh, another shows me it was LAPD. And they say we have a search warrant, and I don't know anything about I don't know about anything law uh, anything about law or search warrant. I'm a high school dropout, right? I, I, I served maybe one year in high school. <laughs> <laughs> served like a prison sentence. Well, uh, I, I did. I did bu- a bunch of homework and I did some of the tests. And uh, <laughs> they said we have this search warrant. And I just, you know, I'm like, what can I do? What can I do? And I recalled an episode of 24 where they said, show me the search warrant. <laughs> so I said, show me the search warrant. And I don't know if that actually applies in law or if it was like CGI. They're like, <laughs> what? Excuse yeah. me? Yeah. They're like, wait, what? Oh, okay. Uh, it's upstairs. I'm like, oh, okay. And they started talking to me and they didn't mention any specifics. And I was hoping it was MySpace, actually, at that point. <laughs> so, you know, as a hacker, you play around, you know, you play around and you, you go through different things that maybe you're not supposed to go into. Never malicious, never like causing harm, but you want to see what you can get into. It's a puzzle. It's a, it's a real world applicable puzzle, um, what you can break into. And after about half an hour, I'm like, guys, you know, do your search. I'm not going to obstruct. Just show me the search warrant and do your thing. Um, so we go upstairs, with these four guys and me, and uh, we walk up to my place, and uh, my girlfriend's in a, wrapped in a sheet, crying, and my roommate is this in your apartment. In my apartment, yeah, my apartment at the time, in, in the marina, <laughs> Marina Del Rey, and my my roommate's good friend of mine. It's your, like naked, weeping girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Good start. And my roommate, he's in a bath towel and wet. <laughs> What is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> At first, I suspected something, but right. uh, but she's she's you know she was in bed in my room, and he was in the shower getting ready for work when 
a dozen agents busted into my apartment that I had not known. So while I was going downstairs. Oh, so while you were down at the car, they were already exactly. going into the apartment. While I was downstairs, unbeknownst to me, they were in my apartment going through everything. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and they finally handed me the search warrant. I read through it. And it finally mentioned something of MySpace. And I was like, okay, it's MySpace related, obviously. Uh, and after that, they they just went through everything. And, and from you know my roommate and girlfriend's perspective, they just came in with guns. It finally... Finally, something in the movie Hackers was real. Like a dozen agents busting into your place to, you know, get a computer crime guy with a bunch of, you know, semi-automatic weapons. And uh, watch it. What am, what am I going to do with like a DVD? Like throw it at you? <laughs> I'm not sure. But they had this search warrant and it said they could pretty much take anything that had data on it. So they went through my, they took my computer, my laptop, my iPod. Uh, my Xbox, any CDs, DVDs, uh, and sat me down. And as I'm reading the search warrant further and further. And finally, it comes to this part, and it says they can search my body, my car, my my home, and this other address. I'm like, what's this address? Oh, no, my company. Uh. And at this point, this is two years in, probably had 30 employees, investors. We had, it was a legitimate company. <laughs> A legitimate tech startup that companies depended on for their phone service. A, lot, uh, a decent number of companies depended on us. And I was like, you guys are going to my company? And they're like, oh, no, we're already there. <laughs> now, I never, I, I never knew this. But, you know, I heard this secondhand from 20 people. <laughs> but simultaneously, another dozen agents went to my company and said, who runs this place? And Chris, the CEO, came out. And he said, uh, and they said, what does Sammy Kamkar have access to? He said, well, yeah, he's co-founder. I mean, everything. And the guy looks back at another agent and says, all right, guys, take everything. <laughs> and I'm like, no, <laughs> right? I don't know what Chris did, but he, I don't know what he did, but for two hours, he somehow, and Chris is, I mean, he like mentored me for years. And I mean, Chris Lyman, this guy's awesome and uh, taught me so much about These are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what, what magic he used because I, I didn't have any. <laughs> but he got them to uh, ultimately not take the server room <laughs> and turn down essentially all these companies that are depending on a phone system for their company that are, uh, you know, call centers. <laughs> they didn't take down all these companies' call centers. Instead, they just took my computer and my phone. And, uh, Put everyone in a put everyone in the conference room. <laughs> had guns out and said, "You know, get off that keyboard." It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, uh, a friend of mine. It was his first day. It was that his <laughs> one of my best friends? It was actually, I didn't. I I met him online. Like we met online in a, like a forum or something, and he emailed me. And what did you do today? <laughs> what did you do today? <laughs> it's the most interesting thing. Of the week. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> um, and I said, I actually, I convinced him to leave his job in Denver, and he came out with a U-Haul to to come work at my company. And I said, Hey, while you're while you're, uh, you know, come stay at my place. So he, I was actually crashing at my place. <laughs> he didn't run into the Secret Service because we had in my apartment complex we had two. Uh, Two play, two garages, one for guests and one for residents. So I went to the residents where they were waiting. He went to the guests, drove to work, didn't know anyone. It was his first day. It was Monday. <laughs> so he goes to like shake his hand to someone, and she's like, "Hand off the mouse and keyboard. Go in the conference room. Secret Service." <laughs> and he's like, "What?" And he has his U-Haul out back. Poor Matt with all his crap. <laughs> with all his crap. He had just quit his job, drove out from Denver. <laughs> To this company, you know, that he met me once. It's like it's JT like, Marling and Associates <laughs> from, so you know, I, I hear from, this from Boiler Room. I hear this, you know, later on because <laughs> it's like not talking to me for a little bit. <laughs> it's like, comes out to this company that he thinks is getting shut down. He, no one has any idea why a dozen agents are at their company. Nobody. They just know my name was said. They took my computer and they left. Um, Poor guy. <laughs> so <laughs> he didn't know what to think. I explained it to everyone, and it's like, oh yeah, that's weird. <laughs> that's funny, but unexpected. And uh, I so they took my computer. Worst part was they took my iPod. That was probably the worst because all my music was on my computer and my iPod, and it's just really hard to get music back then. <laughs> <laughs> so I then got a lawyer, and you know, for six months I fought with the DA. 
And, uh, I, you know, I was, part of me was like, well, you know, I, I think they, it, it was a bit much, right? I did, I did something wrong. There's no doubt about that. I, you know, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that again. And, uh, but they were being, it was very harsh. Um, I felt it was very harsh. And what they were trying to do was take away my computer use for the rest of my life. For the rest of your life? For the rest of my life. So, again, I didn't have a high school diploma. Uh, I, you know, I uh, help my mom. Like, I send money to my mom. Uh, you know, I moved out when I was 15. And I think, you know, I, I forged emancipation documents so no. I could actually live <laughs> live by myself and sign, uh, get a cell phone in an apartment. Um and I had to support, support myself and help support her a little. And uh, so I couldn't do anything. Like, if I couldn't touch computers, I don't know what, what I'd do. I'd have to, I don't know, finish high school. <laughs> I just couldn't imagine that. Yeah, so. well, in this day and age also, I mean, just with the exponential growth of these technologies, it's like, how can you possibly avoid mm, not sure. touching Sure. A computer. I mean, you would you would have to just go into uh, live in like with in Pennsylvania with the uh, <laughs> the, Amish, the, the yeah. Amish, yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> so they tr- they were trying to take away your access to computers for the rest of your of your correct, natural life. Correct. Uh, I mean, at first it was like they were talking about prison and all these things. I don't know if they're scaring me or what, but um, ultimately. You know, I had a choice. I had to, I could like spend a lot of time and a lot more money fighting it. You know, I'd spent all my savings. I was 19 to, to fight this and get a good lawyer. And, uh, ultimately we were able to come to an arrangement and that was an agreement where I would not be able to use computers for the rest of my life. However, I would go on probation and I would visit a probation officer, you know, once a week. And if I were on good behavior, I would be able to get that reduced. I'd get, be able to get potentially even removed. And it was re- it was within reason. It was like if I don't commit any crimes or release any other worms, then I would be able to get that removed after a few years. I was like, okay, that's reasonable. I could focus on the my company right now. I had at that point it was bigger. It was another six months later, and I had a team, and I could communicate with my team every day, and I could actually work without necessarily using the internet and doing that much uh, on the internet and on you know computers. Um, and just manage, right? And at that point, I kind of just managed. And I took an ag- that agreement. And after three years, uh, I went back to court and I said, hey, my probation officer loves me. <laughs> uh, I paid all my restitution. I've done my 720 hours of community service picking up trash. Uh, and because of some, you know, they didn't document it properly. So I did another extra few hours. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 800 hours. Uncle Sam, that's yeah, on me. Like that one's on me. Hours later. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Oh, man. <laughs> All this time. 5 a.m. every Saturday. <laughs> you know, it means I didn't. Oof. Oh, it was awful. It was Oof. tough. So, you have to wear a, uh, an orange jumpsuit? I, I, yes. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I would. I would park. <laughs> I would park my car, <laughs> put on an orange jumpsuit at 6 a.m., <laughs> And then walk to the waste refuse management facility. Um, I made friends with the guys who ran it though. They were actually pretty cool. And I would, uh, because they liked me, they would let me go on the trash runs where we would drive around Santa Monica. And that means we got to see the ocean a lot and drive in, drive a dump truck basically picking up trash. Uh, you think I'd be able to like help more effectively? You know, I, I'd be happy to help in other ways, but uh, <laughs> that was the task laid yeah. before you. Yeah. <laughs> so you did your community service, your restitution. So after three years, I went back to court. I went back to court and, uh, you know, I said, I'm a model computer, not touching citizen. <laughs> and, uh, I would love to get, get some of that access back. And, you know, we got everything removed and, uh, I was able to touch computers again, just kind of randomly one day, everything came back. I could touch computers. I wasn't a felon. I had no more probation. I had no more community service. Now, what was it like after three years in technological time to get back up to speed. Mm. I was probably 22 or 23 at this point. And I was, I think it was really cool because I was very fortunate. Um, the thing that I had exploited, uh, the thing that I had exploited when I wrote the worm was something called Ajax or we, you know, some sure. people called web 2.0. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you remember, but this was right when Google maps came out. 
before we had MapQuest. And what would happen on MapQuest, you'd go somewhere, you'd make directions. And if you wanted to like zoom out, you'd click a button and you'd, it would refresh the page. You had to click the plus or the minus. Exactly. Huge pain in the ass. And the page would refresh. And like if you wanted to go right, you couldn't scroll right. You'd hit a right what arrow. What is Ajax asynchronous? Help me out here. Uh, no. I believe it's asynchronous. JavaScript Java. AX. There we go. <laughs> AX. Armani Exchange. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I believe that's Amex. R- RX. Sorry, that's American Express. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so, so were you able to catch up quickly after that? Well, so, tr- so the... The, the worm that I wrote actually abused or used Ajax because I saw Google Maps came out and you could scroll your map. It was amazing. You could scroll. You didn't have to refresh the page every, want, every time you want to go right. This was the coolest thing on, on the web at that point. Yeah, and for people uh, listening who may not be familiar with the term Ajax, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I've had plenty of wine, which leads to overconfidence in matters of my total incompetence. Uh, but Ajax would be, for instance, where you you select from a drop down an item let's say if you're buying a domain name and you're able to see that value change on the page without refreshing the page exactly that would be a consumer experience of ajax right right it used to be you'd, you have the refresh you might hear the click right whenever that information would get refreshed and now you can just seamlessly get new information on your page updating without you uh changing pages right without the whole thing refreshing uh it was that was beautiful and i used that so that, because I could write the worm in a way that it would refresh the page, but that's just annoying. I want it to happen in the background. The, the user shouldn't be bothered that there's a virus running on their computer. <laughs> it should just happen, you know, seamlessly. It should be very comfortable Correct. infiltration. <laughs> yeah, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't cause them harm or annoyance. And yeah. man, that click's annoying. Uh, so that was Ajax. And by the time it came back to computers, uh, this was three years later, something had come out called... Drum roll. The iPhone. Ah. Nothing had changed between then. I mean, for, for the most part, the biggest technologies to hit tech was Web 2.0. Two, three years later, iPhone. So I came back. I was standing in line at uh, the Grove <laughs> waiting for the iPhone. So, and- so you really... You really uh- in a way, threaded the needle. I mean, you really, you you came, you exited and then re-entered the scene in such a way that you really didn't miss a lot of the major developments. Yeah, I, I wish I could say that was by design, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it? I, if I could be good or lucky, I'll take lucky. <laughs> right. Uh, but I will, I, I will say this, um, you know, before then I was, I was, you know, really introverted. <laughs> I was an introverted nerd and. I'm still I'm still a nerd and I uh, love that but <clears throat> those 3 years I wasn't allowed to touch computers the thing that I spent my night and day ever since I was 9 years old and got kicked out of a chat room um that yeah. that changed my life right I had to spend my time doing something else so during the day I was working but then you know at that point I was 20 I turned 21 so I started going out and uh then I started going you know making friends and communicating and socializing uh you know I went out and I said, ah, oh, what is that thing? What's that bright thing? Ah, oh, it's the sun. I started going like outside and doing all these outdoors things. And I, you know, learned about what a gym was. And I did these things because I had nothing else to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> the one thing was taken away. I mean, they took my, they took my Xbox. That's not cool. But I was like, okay, let's, let's roll with it. Right. And I think life is good, right? Life is good no matter what. I mean, at least here in the U S I feel pretty fortunate. So let's, uh, let's, we have other facilities available to us. So let's use those. Now, cam car, just for those people wondering, ethnic background is, uh, Iranian. Iranian. So yeah, my mom is from Iran. Um, my dad is, uh, from Dubai, but also Iranian. And they came to the Pittsburgh to study. They came to the U.S. Carnegie Mellon or? Um, down the street, University of Pitt. Got it. <laughs> University okay. of Pittsburgh. Uh, I would have suggested Carnegie Mellon. What were they <laughs> I, studying? I their tech. Um, and my dad, I, bl- I believe, was business. Uh, my mom, uh, I'm not, telecommunications, I think. Got it. And 
uh, how, ultimately, did they, how did they choose Pittsburgh of all places in the I, U.S.? That's a great question. <laughs> I have no idea. One of the unsolved mysteries. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Well, one of these things. I mean, little little kept secret about Pittsburgh. Yeah. <laughs> Good sandwiches. Good sandwiches. It's like Hoagie Haven <laughs> yeah, in Princeton for all those kebabs. Princetonians listening. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, they went to school there, and my dad, uh, you know, my dad left uh, when I was younger. And, uh, yeah, so... so the, the, they're from Iran. I was born like a year later after they came came here. My mom was like probably twenty. Um, had me kind of young, and yeah, I grew up in Pittsburgh. What, uh, or I should say, who, who are some of the people, whether you met them or not, who most influenced your trajectory through life besides your parents? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say you know it, it changes over time. Um, I mean, I, I love, there's so many people out there who've done so such amazing things or even just have a really cool perspective of the world. So, uh, I tried to, if I can, if I'm fortunate enough, I try to glean some information from people when I can. Um, I say it started <clears throat> when I really, you know, the, the available information on the internet, right? Just the internet itself. Um, I think it was Al Gore who created the internet. That's what I've heard. So, you know, <laughs> he did a great job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He did a great He's job. He's tightened it up. I mean, I, I, you know, I've, Every, everything I, I've, a lot of what I've accomplished or am learning is be, from the internet. So thanks to that. But if it were people, then I would say when I was young, when I was like 15 or 16, I got my first contract on the internet. And, um, just a friend of mine, someone I met online who had taught me about business. Um, when my mom told me. This is with the cheats, right? This is the, with the cheat codes. codes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I was writing these Counter Strike cheats and someone said, Hey, do you want a job? And, this guy, uh, <laughs> this guy, Stan, he actually taught me a lot about business because uh, then I needed a job. My mom lost her job and she said, Sammy, you need, you're not going to school. You're just playing games all day. You need to get a job and help pay rent um, if you're going to live here. And I said, okay. So uh, I, you know, I was trying to fill out applications at Starbucks and Ralph's and um, someone emailed me named Stan and said, hey, I saw your cheat code. Uh, she started cheat software. Do you want to write software for my company? We're doing uh, some sort of game development stuff. It's like, absolutely. So I contracted with this guy and met him. He was awesome. And he, uh, at that point, I did a little contract for him. And then I was contracting for another company. And they wanted me to work full time. And my mom said, well, if you're going to work for a company full time, you know, take, you know, if I, I was like, mom, what do I do in the negotiation when they ask how much? <laughs> if they ask how much. And She's like, just say, you know, whatever you want. Or just, or just say, you know, s tell them this low number. And, you know, if they say that's too much, just accept lower. And I had like lunch with Stan. He's like, oh, so you're going to tell them that you have a base expectation of 75K and, you know, their offer that you have, that's their, that's uh, what they're offering. And that you're going to get, you know, the other offer has, a, you know, a five year stock grant. Uh, with 5,000 shares, and that's what you want. And you're and, like, I like Stan's advice. And, well, I'm like, I have no idea what you just said. And, I'm, <laughs> and that's all bullshit. And he's like, so? And I'm like, I don't have another offer. And I, I don't want to lie. I don't want to be deceptive. And I'll say that. That's like, you know, besides fake profiles on OkCupid, <laughs> the other time it's okay to be deceptive is in, during an interview because they're being deceptive to you probably. <laughs> so during your, uh, during your initial interview, um, and so I, I went into this meeting as a 15 year old kid, just repeating the lines because I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> You're just reading verbatim. <laughs> exactly. Oh, the other offer has a five year stock grant. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what <Yeah>. say you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it had a six month cliff and a five year ve vesting period. That's like, I don't know what <laughs> word salad. Anything. Hopefully that no compels you to give me more I money. What stock was. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, I thought in my head, well, the only reason I, I followed his advice was because he was a very smart and logical guy. I really respected him because of that. Um, and everything he had told me and uh, taught me, I mean, he was pretty much always correct about things. And I'm also okay with taking risks. I'm that's acceptable. Like there's always another way to do something. Um, so I followed his advice and I walked, you know, and actually I went down for this meeting and they said, Hey, uh, they had lunch with me and I took the Amtrak to go see them in San Diego, this company that I'd been working with remotely. They never met me. And I went, took the Amtrak down and it's really like hoping I got this job. We had dinner, it was really friendly and just kind of casual. 
And that was that. I was like, guy, and I felt like it was weird. It's like a slap in the face. Like we never talked about the job. We never talked about like, am I getting this job? Are you guys going to hire me? I really could use a job. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, so guys, did you want to talk about like, I don't know, salary? And I was really timid. Um, Another reason that not having a computer was awesome because I was forced to talk to people. (laughs) So they're like, sure, let's talk. And they're like, what would you like? Like, and I just repeated verbatim what he told me, what he taught me. And it was, you know, I have a, you know, well, my base expectation is 75 K and another offer for that at another company in LA. Uh, it would be better in LA because that company, I I already lived there in my head. I'm like, please let me leave L like not let LA. I love LA, but please let me move out of my mom's place and get my own place. (laughs) If I'm making 75 K, I can afford a place. (laughs) Um, and, and handle my palm's place, right? Mm-hmm. And cover her. So, and, uh, I have this, you know, stock grant, whatever, blah, 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 word garble. And they looked at each other and said, okay. And I was flabbergasted. And so, so what he, I mean, he taught me a ton in my early years, right? That was my first time in a real job, a full-time job. He got me, he got me a 40 gear, 40 K a year raise. Uh, now this is Stan who had hired you based on your cheat codes. Correct. Yeah. So he became a mentor, and then for the next job, he was. It, it, for, it was for that job, he was my mentor. Like he lived in San Diego, so I hung out with him all the time. He was older. He's probably so 30s. he was helping you negotiate against his own company or against. Uh, different... No, I was contracting for him. I had written yeah. some software for him. That was that. Like he right. didn't need a lot, so I helped him. You know, did a little contract. And after that, we just became, remained friends. Got it. Got it. Older guy, scientist, um, uh, doctor, like really, really, really smart guy. Hmm. Uh, when you think of the word uh, successful, who's the first person who comes to mind for you? Hmm. Successful. Hmm. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of successful people. I mean, I guess it depends how you interpret success. Well, that's um, that's up to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'd say uh, lately it's like. A lot of it's just how how can you remain happy, right? What can you do to actually increase your net happiness while reducing uh, the the negative the the negatives in your life, and without hurting people? I think that's that's kind of like I, I don't have many morals or ethics. I have like one pretty strict rule, which is don't intentionally hurt someone. Is that ahimsa? Is that what they call it? <laughs> I, think I think that's do no harm. It's also the Hippocratic oath, but yeah. Oh no no. Do no harm intentionally. Right, right. Got it, got it. Yeah. Do no there's harm like intentionally. Fire, there's like a trail of, of fire. <laughs> a scorched earth behind right, me. Just, <laughs> but I'm just, you know, as long as it's not intentional. Fact. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> no deliberate harm. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. <laughs> so who... Uh, oh, man. I mean, there, there are people who, like, I think respect and uh, I, I try to... Everyone, I think everyone I meet has someone to teach me, has something to teach me. Um, I think Richard Branson is really cool just because it's like every time I, I read about him or learn a little bit about him, he's like having fun and has, you know, he's on an island or on a ship or like racing across the ocean. I mean, he's doing awesome things. Um, he's having fun. He's not necessarily defining success or doing things based off what is expected of you, right? He's... Uh, he's doing, I think what he wants and that's what I really like. I want to, you know, that's who I want to do things that I want, um, and have fun and really enjoy my life. Um, and hope maybe I can contribute in some ways, but who are, uh, who are some of the people who had the biggest influence on your worldview besides Stan? let's just say after Stan, is there anyone who has had on my worldview? Yeah. Or just way of thinking about life. Mm -hmm. Are there other people? Well, let's, let's take it even more granular, uh, in the world of, and this is a term that's become unfortunately very overused, but in the world of hackers, right? People Mm -hmm. are finding non obvious solutions to problems. Uh, is there anyone who had a, a particularly large influence on you? Uh, in the in the world of hackers, I mean, Kevin Mitnick was kind of the the biggest well known hacker. Sure. Uh, so I've always followed him. The art of deception. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the so business I, card made of lock picks. <laughs> <laughs> so amazing. Uh, but if I had to, if I had to give specific people that I think are are awesome, uh, have been doing awesome things. Um, Pablo Pablo Holman is one guy. Um, 
he's part of this uh, uh, group called the Shmoo Group. And when the I went to what group? Shmoo. Shmoo. S H M O O. Shmoo Group. And I found out about them when I was like, when I was a kid and when I moved to LA when I was 13. Uh, I, what was his name again? Uh, Pablos. P A B L O S. Okay. Pablos Holman. Um, I feel like I went to an event maybe, where he spoke maybe. and and he had a device that he waved across the front row of the crowd and captured all of their credit card information that in their sounds, wallets. That sounds like Pablos. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy is awesome. I mean, he's uh, he's down to earth, right? Sociable. Um, these are elements that a lot of hackers lack, right? And I really like that. I, I like the ability to, you know, sit down and sit down in front of like numbers and just unattractive code and also be able to communicate with people and actually have a real relationship with people and, and, and socialize more. Another reason I love being away from computers for three years, right? It, it forced me to socialize. And if I didn't have that, you know, this conversation would be very different. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I really like Pablo's just because when I learned about the Schmoo group, I was 14 years old and I was at, it was the first time at my favorite, uh, uh, at, at a conference called DEF CON, one of the biggest hacker conferences in the world. It's in Vegas every year. And they had this robot that would drive around and it had it was two big wheels and a screen. And all it did was show you your passwords. Oh, God. <laughs> so it would drive up to you wirelessly. And it would just be like, this is your password. And you're like, what? <laughs> if you had a phone or you're on your laptop, it would just sniff <laughs> passwords in the air and show you. That's terrifying. I thought it was beautiful. Uh, beautiful and terrifying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like so many things in life. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he's definitely a, a guy. And, and also... Dan Kaminsky is another really, really smart, really... Uh, I know that name for some reason. Yeah, Why do I know that name? Really, uh, he's found some huge vulnerabilities in the internet. <laughs> so if you've heard of the internet, and uh, he, he had something called the Kaminsky bug a few years ago where he found um, a way that he could essentially control any domain name. If he wanted Google.com to point to his website, he could. Um, that seems and he reasonably it. powerful. Yeah, very powerful. And he, and he you know, he... He made a huge effort to resolve it very quickly and effectively. Um, so I think you know, he's been someone I've watched at DEF CON ever since I was 14 years old. And uh, How so, many people attend DEF CON each I mean, year? Now it's over, it's over 10,000. It's probably like 15,000 wow. per year. Now, is it from the standpoint of a, a non-techie? I have a, I have a severe uh, anxiety related to this. So I've heard of DEF CON for quite some time. Okay. And uh, we were talking about... You know the the magazine that that you read for quite some time, twenty six hundred. Yeah. That's right, twenty six hundred, which I which I picked up years ago, but lacked uh, much to my embarrassment. Sort of the technical chops to appreciate, even though I picked it up. Uh, should someone be intimidated and afraid of going to say a DefCon? Yeah, I, I, are there risks involved? Uh, that's a great question. If you turn off your phone, <laughs> you should not be afraid. Uh, everyone's actually really cool. I mean, yeah. this is you, because yeah. I would love to attend. I've never been, but my fear is that as a non-techie, I would just be, you know, caught with my pants down, bent over a barrel, every which way from Sunday because I am so easy to exploit in that respect. I, I would say, I would say, turn uh, seriously, turn off your phone, turn off your laptop. And talk to people. Like people, A, everyone, it's almost like all the hackers are among friends. Um, I know I am. Like when I'm there, it's like, it, these are my friends. And the, whether I know them or not, these are, these are people who have similar interests to, Kindred me, spirits. to me and even you, right? Yeah. If you find it interesting enough that you'd want to attend. Um, and some really smart people, some really interesting people from all walks of life. Uh, but there are definitely people who are, and we call they're called script kitties in the community. Right. <laughs> in the hacker community. I want, I want you to I elaborate on kitty. this. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean I grew up, I was a script kitty. You know, when I learned about a denial of service attack. <laughs> yeah. When I, learned, when I downloaded WinNuke and knew I could t crash someone's computer or that I could open someone's CD ROM, <laughs> that was one of the fun ones. Uh, I could just open any of my friends CD ROMs. Just to poltergeist your friends. Yeah. These are the ones that came, right? It would just like come out, right? They'd be like surfing the web and boom. CD-ROM open. <laughs> you're like, what? <laughs> uh, 
that uh, a script kitty is someone who doesn't necessarily you know doesn't necessarily know what they're doing, but they've downloaded some program or script that is doing something you know out of out of their uh, hacker pay grade, right? It's out of their technical <laughs> chops, and that's okay. I mean, that's that's how how you learn. That's how you learn anything, right? You you take what you can, and there's nothing wrong with um, using the tools available. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So I. I I don't think you should be a malicious. I'm not a malicious hacker. I don't want to uh, destroy or or hurt people. Um, I I really want to, you know, sort of. Uh, I want to show people the the lack of security that exists today, and and hopefully help protect them and teach other people like what they can learn. So you have, I think, in the uh, let's just say the mainstream perception of hackers, the white hats, right? Mm-hmm. Just like spy versus spy. You got the good yeah. guy. Sure. You got the black hats, right. the bad guys, uh, the malicious folks, and then you have the gray hats or the people in between. Uh, how do those different groups think philosophically? Because the, 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 I guess the, the idea being, uh, if you look at the Stalins of the world, the Hitlers of the world, they absolutely, and I'm not equating that to black hat at all, but I'm just saying they believe themselves to be doing the right thing, right? So what are the philosophical orientations of those different groups? Um, you know, I'd say if you're black hat, you know, perhaps ignorance, you know, perhaps ignorance is bliss. And I've learned that I'm ignorant of a lot of things when I don't think about it. If I don't actually take the time to sit down and think, how does this, let's say, affect someone? How would I feel if I were in this other person's shoes? I can remain ignorant about something. Um, and sometimes you want to, right? Uh, sometimes I don't want to know that. Well, know, this... right. If you're a guy in Las Vegas who's remotely flying drones in Iraq, mm-hmm. blowing up dozens or hundreds of people, yeah, you think of it as a first-person shooter game, not as a right. real-world exercise. I mean, i got to be honest. Like Every time I eat a steak, I'm like, I don't... Uh, I'm intentionally not thinking about what happens. Yeah. Right? More and more, I do think about this now, uh, but... I love a steak, so I'm like, maybe I should just be a little black hat in my food, in my food <laughs> etiquette. Uh, so I eat. black hat carnivore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh man, I mean, I love it. So uh, you know, I'm being ignorant, and now I'm just, I'm just being silly. But uh, I'd say, yeah, black hats are, are aren't really, f- and I think that's true of anything. If you don't think about how it actually affects somebody, then you're doing that. Um, I'm oh more wine. <laughs> Oh, there's there's more wine to be had, so I shall pour more wine. Uh, what's this wine called? Uh, oh, this is uh, this is a somewhat amusing uh, label, and I may be abusing my housemate's wine collection. Sorry, so, housemate. Sorry, housemate. So there's a a very trippy tattooed chick on a what appears to be a motorcycle on the label, and the brand is if u c k i f. Y O U S E E K A Y, which spells, of course, F U C K I E, fuck, which is <laughs> such a delectable, flexible curse word in the English language. Uh, for those interested, there is a book called English as a Second Fucking Language, <laughs> all about the use of the word fuck, which is really, really fascinating. <laughs> but I digress. And we've killed our second bottle. Can't wait to read well, the spark. Notes well on done. That. Good work, Sammy. <laughs> Good work, Tim. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about uh, black hats, steaks. Uh, Another thing. Were you, were you ever a black hat? Oh, man. I mean, uh, you know, I guess me, people might see black hat differently. I think if you're trying to sort of – a lot of black hats, typically what they're doing is they're hacking for financial gain. Um, mm-hmm. I've never hacked for financial gain uh, except for all the jobs I've gotten for hacking, uh, <laughs> but not hacking maliciously. Uh, I would say – a lot of hackers, and I find a lot of them, you know, a lot of the black hats are actually in like Romania and Russia and a lot of countries where uh, maybe they don't, uh, I don't know, hit you so hard for doing that. Uh, yeah. Maybe there aren't that many laws around that. Romania seems to be a real hotbed for yeah. a lot of that. I mean, they have, they have like Western unions every <laughs> like half block. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's astonishing. I mean, it's really become a sort of a, a, a nexus. For a lot of that activity. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's why I'm in Romania nine months a year. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> that's where your summer home is. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's where my first home is. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, uh, but I would say 
so black hats are typically doing it for financial financial gain. Uh, and there's so many ways to do it for financial gain. And I learned that a long time ago. And um, What are some of the ways to do it for, for financial gain? Okay, so uh, for one, stealing credit cards. Uh, hacking into companies is actually is almost trivial. I'll just say that. Anyone can learn how to hack. Um, anyone can learn these things. And that's one of the things I'm trying to teach people. It's like how, the, how computers work, how technology works. And anyone can, let's say, break into a company if you try. Uh, a company that, for example, uh, does retail. And if you do retail, then you can, uh, let's say you've saved your credit card somewhere. You can then seal that database full of credit card numbers. Uh, and you can then sell that. You can either monetize it yourself and you can, you know, produce credit cards using a mag stripe writer and create your own credit cards and use them. Or you could sell it to someone else who already has that, has that handled. I mean, there's sort of a little distribution chain that goes down. That's one simple example of someone who could be an entire novice. Uh, you know what you might call a script kitty, and who can steal databases just enough to be dangerous, full of credit cards, yeah. and sell it and make money. Um, this is a huge thing. This is actually why, you know, well, this is a lot of what the Secret Service does. Besides protecting the president, it's also protecting like money. And online is the easiest way to steal money. Um, also, like as you saw, Pablo's right. He probably, you know, he waved. He probably waved something. Is my guess. Where yeah. RFID based. Yeah, he stole your totally. credit card uh, number because. These yeah, are, yeah, just to, just to explain one more time to folks, <laughs> this was many years ago too. This was not recently. And he had a small handheld device, uh, that he waved at the front row while giving a keynote and was able to <laughs> capture all their credit card information oh, from their wallets. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. <laughs> oh God. So yeah. yeah, you're just getting credit card numbers. I mean, the, the beauty, beautiful thing about that, that RFID, that RF, that's radio frequency, right? It's the same thing as stealing cars. Um, you can <clears throat> just walk through Times Square and just steal numbers without ever touching a person. It's insane. So you can then sell those, right? There's a black market. There's a market that. Where does someone go to sell credit cards? Uh, I can give you a list of sites. No, I'm just, uh, there, there's a lot of, there's forums, uh, yeah. typically fri- private forums. There's also government, you know, governments, uh, definitely in those forums as well. But yeah. Governments who buy those credit cards? Who buy those credit cards, who try to f- track those credit cards. I subcontracted for a company, uh, for 13 years ago that, uh, worked with FBI. And, what uh, what we were doing was tracking down a huge thief of credit cards. And they had not only penetrated a company that had credit cards, you know, like a retailer. They had penetrated, this ha- hacker group had penetrated a gateway. A gateway is who your credit cards go through. To, oh, today, sure. it would be like a Stripe or a PayPal. Or an authorized, authorized net. net. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a credit card processor. It's the people who get all the credit cards from all the money, you know, all the companies online. And they had penetrated one of those servers. And we had found this. Uh, the FBI told us, and we investigated, and we had a little bit of authorization to hack these Romanian servers. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So, uh, Mul- essentially... Mulțumesc. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I, I, I essentially... Ce faci? <laughs> being there. I've spent a little bit of time around the Romanians. Oh, guys. Yeah, they're fun. Fun group. <laughs> Talk. Uh, so they would, uh, and I, you know, essentially the, our job was to track them and find them. And, um, we did after I found this one of the hackers and found their chat room and chatted with them and became friends. And they'd send me pictures. And I saw this guy's new Viper in his, in his garage, <laughs> brand new Viper cash. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> Romania it's, cash. It's power move. <laughs> yeah. That's like New Jack City style in Romania. Yeah. And uh, that's how we found them. And um, I mean, the crazy thing is so many things are hacked on a daily basis and we just don't know. And a lot of the times, you know, the companies are required to tell their users. Not everyone tells you that you got hacked, right? We hear about hacks all the time now. And it's uh, unfortunate, but so many companies are being hacked and don't know it. What do you think of using services like a one password or last pass or whatnot to oh. try to improve your security with passwords? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a tough question for me. Um, just because I'm unsure how I feel about them. Um, I don't, I personally don't subscribe to them 
just for the fact that they are, seem like a big target, right? If I were, if I were, it's a high value target. Yeah, if I were H- malicious, HVT is it? Say, I would be like analyzing their code every day, trying to find a flaw, so that when I want, I could then get. When I do hack computers, when I do drop, you know, some malware on a website, I then get all your passwords, not just you know, not just one. Yeah. So the Above idea the is. Uh, however, in, in general, I think they're doing a good thing because I, I believe if you're a person who uses the same password for every website, I believe it's superior to use a program like LastPass or, um, yeah, Abine, Abine has a, as another password per manager. Right. Um, one password, whatever. Yeah. So I believe it's better to use those than to use the same password everywhere. Uh, what I would suggest to everyone, uh, something I do. I don't make ridiculous passwords that are hard to remember. I make really easy passwords to remember. And they're just really long. Usually lyrics in a song. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you know. Welcome just, to the jungle, baby. Exactly. Et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Think of your, you know, favorite Puff Daddy song. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Dr. Dre. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, money. I don't need to choose some lyrics. Uh, it doesn't matter if there's not a, you know, crazy, like, exclamation marks and like capital letters. You don't need all that. If it's really long, but easy to remember, that's much better than an exclamation mark in the middle for a short password. And you can remember it right for your bank. You use stuff related to bling, you know, for a different website, just what's, you know, what makes you think of that website? What other precautions, uh, you freaked me out. I, I, I hadn't mentioned my name before, but I will now with the hijacking of laptop cameras. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I just got a new computer. I need to cover up that camera. But uh, what other precautions would you suggest that people take? Well, I'd say there's a pretty advanced technology that you can actually use to protect you against um, someone invading essentially the camera. You know, recently, someone uh, um, people have found that they've been able to enable the MacBook cameras without the light coming on. Wow. And the and. Uh, Supposedly, the FBI has been able to do this for years, but now it's been found by other people and demonstrated, demonstrated, right? Um, so there's a pretty advanced technology uh, that came out a long time ago called the Post-It, and you can apply the Post-It <laughs> just above, <laughs> just over the camera. And when you wish to Skype or FaceTime... Um, you or, can lift said Post-It. <laughs> exactly. Or masking tape. <laughs> Correct. Which was my, <laughs> my go-to. Correct. What... Uh, are there any software programs uh, or applications that you use to improve security or anonymity oh, man. on this your is, computer? This is a weird one. And this is something that I will, this is, it makes me feel funny. Um, there's a software Could called. Could be the one. There's a software <laughs> called TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt. Correct. TrueCrypt. Yeah. This is a, a software. Uh, it's open source. It's been developed to help you encrypt your either hard drive or folder or flash drive. And it allows you to say, okay, if you have information you want to protect, you can encrypt it with this software called TrueCrypt. Um, you, it requires a password. And no one knows who created TrueCrypt. It's always been open source. It's probably been a team of developers. And that's really cool. Um, recently, maybe a few months ago, the website changed. And it said TrueCrypt is insecure. Don't use it. Go use something else. And that was it. The author said that and it was done. This is one of the craziest things. There are very few, there are very few products or pieces of software out in the world that are anonymous, that are run by anonymous, you know, anonymous group and that are successful. TrueCrypt is a success. Lots of people, when I say success, I mean people who want protection use TrueCrypt. So it's kind of scary. To hear the thing that you've been, at least if you're in my world, you would be using TrueCrypt if you want to protect information because it has a wide base of users, of smart users who already understand cryptography um, and who want to protect their stuff and aren't just using something random off the shelf that just may or may not have flaws. Uh, because it's open source, it can be analyzed and audited by other people. And just recently, probably within the past few days, an audit of... Past few days. The past bro. few days. Uh, an audit of TrueCrypt has been completed because for a long time, people have been saying we need to audit TrueCrypt just to make sure it's secure. Um, and an audit hasn't been completed. And there were some minor flaws, some flaws that could be exploited, but nothing nothing huge, nothing wary, nothing like 
oh, there's a uh, back door in here. So why do you think that message was put out? Oh, man, I have no idea. I mean, the question is, did someone... There have been some interesting things that have happened recently, especially with the revelations of Snowden. Uh, for one thing, there's these gag orders that we've now learned about that sometimes the NSA can send a gag order and say, uh, you know, we want information and you can't tell your cut, your users, you can't tell the public that we gave you, that we gave you this gag order. Um, so uh, I think some sites are actually employing something where they say, we have never been asked by the government to provide any information. We're just so completely if, if they ever incorrect. do get, well, no, no, no. They, they, they ask this, they put this up before they've ever been asked. Oh, so I if see. they're ever asked, they have to take it down. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> so that, this hasn't been tested in court, but the idea is that's how do you, clever though. So no, yeah, no, it's like a plausible you, deniability thing. They're exactly. Like, oh, one of the cool things about TrueCrypt um, is that TrueCrypt T R U E C R Y Y P T. Jesus Correct. Christ! True crypt, right, yeah. Let's have some more wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True crypt. Uh, one thing that's really interesting about TrueCrypt is that it has a feature. Called uh, about plausible deniability. For example, if you're at a border and someone requests you to give you give them your password, you have to. In border crossings, you you have no. I mean, they have full jurisdiction. They can do whatever they want. Um. So if they ask you for your password, you have to give it, or you could just like go to you know Mexican jail. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not not an attractive option, <laughs> generally <Right>. speaking. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Uh, you can just comes back teeth. to our losing your front teeth, losing your thumbs question. <laughs> right. <laughs> or teeth. Uh, so if there's an interesting feature with TrueCrypt where you can apply two passwords to a hidden drive. Or I'm sorry, not a hidden drive, an encrypted drive. So let's say you have an encrypted folder. It has a password that unlocks it. And if you go to the border and they say, give us your password, you have to give it up. And now those files are for them to use as they please. Uh, TrueCrypt has a feature where you can use two passwords, and it decrypts the same drive with two different passwords. So one is a decoy? One is a, essentially a, a decoy. And the beautiful part about the way it works is that the data is all randomized when it's encrypted. There's no way to prove that you're using the secondary password. It's impossible to prove. Today, it's impossible. We, don't, we know of no possible way today uh, with the existing technology to show that there is one or two passwords used. Most people only use one. Most people only need one because they don't care if they don't care if the government gets this information. They're protecting corporate secrets, for example, or they're protecting, you know, private pictures or whatever. Um, some people do care. And if they do care, they can use this additional feature where it uses essentially the same encrypted method. And when you give up a password, there's no way to prove whether there's a secondary password in use or not. Um, so that's a really cool feature, I think. And I think plausible deniability is really interesting. It's a really interesting thing to play with. Super interesting. I know guys who, uh, these are CEOs of companies who go to China and they will always bring a effectively blank netbook with them to China because they assume whenever they check into a half decent hotel in China that their data is immediately being downloaded. Yeah. From their computers. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, man, having spent some time in China, that would not surprise me in the least. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just recently, uh, I mean, literally in the past few days as well, uh, Google, uh, China's uh, certificate agency, the, the people who encrypt all the web traffic in China, gave out a fake certificate for Google.com so that they could essentially, oh, well, they claim that it was an accident. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but essentially, if you're if you're using them, if you're in China and you go to a Google.com domain or like Gmail, for example, that you believe is encrypted, they can decrypt everything. Oh, Jesus Christ! They can Christ. read your email, for example. That is a uh, a very literal example of those of you who speak Chinese. That is, zhou hou man, zhou hou man is mean. is taking the back door, which is an ex- <laughs> which is an expression used typically to refer to, say, you know, bribing officials or something like that. Doing something very unofficial that gets official results, but uh, 
accident. <laughs> right, Come right. on. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, it, I'll say when it comes to tools, if you're looking for more tools, I keep a private. Uh, it's just my personal list of what I'm using today. And it's if you want to see it, it's sammy.pl slash tools. This is a rad list. I've, I've looked at this before, guys. So you, yeah. sh- you should it's check just, it out. It's just a Google Doc. I keep it. Uh, I don't, I usually just send it to my friends. But uh, if people are interested in the, <laughs> what I'm using today, this is my updated list of what the software I run pretty much. Cool. Sammy.pl forward slash tools. Yeah. All right, cool. I will link to that as well. Uh, do, uh, do you read much? Do you read books? It, I don't. Um, I, I was about to say I, I used to. No, I never did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 no, I, I've read, I've read, <laughs> I read here and there. Um, and it, I'm I, pretty much what I do is like, I'll read a few pages and I love Amazon because they let you read a few pages. And if I'm, you know, if I feel and you know addicted, and sometimes I do, then I keep reading and what I are, buy it. What are the last books that have caught your attention that way? Mm, caught my attention. Um, Where are books that come to mind that have okay, stuck uh, with you? Okay, I mean, lately I've been like into mechanical engineering, so I've been re- reading mechanical engineering books. But I'd say things that like have affected me um, and changed changed me that I think are really cool. Um, I would say one book is called Influence by Robert Cialdini. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I learned that about, uh, I believe it was Stan who told me about that. And uh, when I was 16 and I read that, I mean, this was came, this came out before I was born. It was in the early 80s. Um, Jesus Christ. Wait, when were you born again? 85. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> <laughs> Youngin. <laughs> Little sea monkey pup. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. So, <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so, influence I had my age come crashing down upon me. Please, <laughs> please, con- please continue. <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, so, child, uh, influence. Uh, it, it's a book about influence and and how humans can be influenced and persuaded to do things. I mean, I don't know what I don't recall whether it's a book for salespeople or for like manipulating people or how to protect yourself. It's a little bit of, of all of it, actually. Um, and I love it because it was a very systematic and analytical approach to the most common ways that human beings have been known to be influenced and persuaded to do something. You could use it for sales. You could use it to uh, attract people. You could use it for, I mean, these are life skills. I, I believe these are life skills. Definitely. Scarcity. Absolutely. The time restrictions. Sure. Social proof. I have to run to save some penguins, but. <laughs> You're right. right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these are these are common principles, and that's uh, likability too, right? To save some penguins, like yeah, <laughs> likability. So the, I mean, the, those like those shaped me. I mean, it, to to understand how I could, and, and it's not influence people in a negative way. I mean, it can be used that way, but it's how how can I socialize with the humans around me, and how can I like befriend people, and how can I, um, you know. How can I use reciprocity to to have people in my life who I like and respect and appreciate, and I want them to respect me back, right? I want them to appreciate me. So how can I use these tactics and methods appropriately to do that? What uh, when you need to be in the zone for coding or anything else? What music do you listen to Ooh. these days? Okay, cool. That's a great question. I love love music mm-hmm. um <laughs> i go to i listen to a, a blog <laughs> audio uh, audio molly.com audio molly audio molly.com that's an amazing name. Sure, yeah, <laughs> name we can take that a lot of directions <laughs> but that's an amazing yeah, name it's a, it's a edm so it's a lot of electronic dance music and um they have uh just sort of like the it's the latest stuff but it's not it's not poppy it's Man, I mean, I don't care if it's poppy or not. It's just if it's really good, then I really like it. So I'd say lately I've listened to a lot of electronic music. So uh I know you've had man, you had someone from the glitch mob on. Yeah, so Beretta, like, Justin. Great oh, guy. Man, I love the glitch mob. Yeah, they're right? great. Glitch mob, I mean, they came out with an album maybe a year ago or two years ago, and they're one of my favorites. So I would say that kind of music, um uh like the glitch mob, I mean 
infected mushroom uh, infected mushroom yeah another what is this there, there's side audio tracks. molly infected audio molly mushroom <laughs> uh, i mean they're, 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 they're uh, those guys are, are amazing they they play every year i've at never Av- heard them uh, yeah. they're, they, they play every year at avalon and they're always in kind of the latest technology and they use um like they have these massive uh most djs they just hit you know, some people say they hit play. Some people say they scratch, whatever. These guys have these massive, like, 42-inch plexiglass screens in front of them that you, as the audience, can see. You can see what they're doing. They're plexiglass with projection of what they're doing on top. Oh, that's cool. It's so a very minority talking, report. Oh, so minority report. It's <laughs> Yeah, it's this uh, device called the emulator that they're using, and they're tapping so everyone can see what they're doing. They're on the stage live, right, DJing. And uh, it's like so futuristic. It is exactly Minority Minority Report, you know, in EDM. So uh, electronic music is what I listen to a lot. What was it? Infected Mushroom? Infected Mushroom. They've been around for many, many years. An an Israeli duo. This is Israelis. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So proactive. And and they're always keeping up to date with sound. And uh, I think they, they appreciate quality in their work. Like, I really like that. Very cool. Um, I'll ask you a question I haven't asked in a while. Uh, if you had to conjure a face and a name to correlate to punchable. <laughs> <laughs> punchable? Punchable. Yeah. Okay, what, punchable. What, what comes to mind? Oh, I don't I don't know. I don't I don't usually want to punch people. It could, uh, could be a conceptual punchable man foe of some type. <sighs> Tim? <laughs> Tim? That's a fair no, answer. No, no, no. People want to punch me, too. I don't want to punch you. I don't really want to punch people. Uh, shake. You want to shake him really hard. Shake. Chris Rock style, yeah. You don't Whoa, want to punch him. You just okay, want to shake okay, him. Okay, 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 okay. I got, I got one. I don't know who they are. I don't know their names. All right. And I'm not upset at them because I know it's not their fault. But these people making this these map softwares for our phones... <laughs> Like, Just having driven with you recently, this is perfect. I mean, when iPhone came out, Google Maps was there. And it, it wasn't Google, it was Apple slash Google Maps, which was one of the like most beautiful harmonies I've ever seen. It was, an, it was the most effective map software for a mobile phone ever. And then Apple said, no, we're, we don't want your Google stuff. We're going to come out with our own maps and we removed this original map software. And instead of Apple coming out with beautiful software like they normally do, they're like, here's some shitty software for you. (laughs) Clap your hands. Uh, And that was awful. And then Google Maps came out. And they they came out with their amazing amazing Google backend. And then they had to design their own app. So they had their UI people and, and their UX people. I'm not sure what UX people, but they came out, their user experience, and they're like, uh, here's like a seal trying to tell you how to like get around town. Seal, like, like our, 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 our. <laughs> <laughs> with amazing backend. Like that's what I think, oh, that's what I love about Google. It's a bunch of engineers, but that's it. I, I need more. There's more than engineers there. I know it. So show me more than the engineer. Like I, I understand the engineering backend, but there's this beautiful creative front end that's like people who actually sit down and use their software and it was when I was uh, shaking my phone in anger recently. And I was like yelling at my Google Maps. And I was like, why won't you just tell me where to go? Why do I have to hit seven times to get to a new directions? And uh, it said, do you have a suggestion for us? And I was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean do I have a suggestion? How do you know? <laughs> How do you know what I'm saying? Are you listening to me? <laughs> That's possible. Um, and a few days later, it happened. Like a week ago, I shook my phone in anger, yelling at it. <laughs> <laughs> Google Maps. I said, do you have a suggestion? And I said, how do you know this? How do you know I'm upset? Are you like reading? Is it like Scientology where they have that e-meter and they can like read your like spiritual harmonics or something? Um, and I was like, well, they must be like listening to me. That's not cool. That's unacceptable. Uh, and then I shook the phone and it did it again. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> someone someone accelerometer at Google based. was yeah. exactly. Someone at Google was pissed off enough. That they're like, oh yeah, I shake my my phone when I use Google Maps all the time. <laughs> we should implement this. <laughs> so, I mean, 
you know, I do love Google Maps uh, and I love Google and they do some really cool stuff, but I, I shake my phone a lot. <laughs> you want to, you want to punch Google Maps in yeah, the face sometimes. Uh, what advice, how old are you right now? 29? I'm 29. Oof, um, man, getting old, getting old. But, uh, I, th- I think I can reverse it. We'll see. <laughs> You've reversed it. Uh, no, no, I'm working on that. I'm just. I'm just going to keep up with your blog and <laughs> <laughs> all of my drug yeah. regimens. Uh, what would, what advice would you give your 20 year old self? Oh, uh, 20 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> Stop committing felonies. <laughs> you can't use a computer, idiot. <laughs> you're, you're sitting there. <laughs> what about 15? 15. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, stop, stop wasting time in school. Uh, <laughs> stop wasting time in school. Um, I mean, it, it depends who, it depends who I'm talking to. Um, if I'm talking to myself, what would I say? Um, uh, man, I mean, so, so much I could tell myself, <laughs> invest in Apple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I would say, I don't know, just, uh, you know, go with the flow. Like I've always tried to go with the flow and I learned early on, I think learning like reading about people meditating or something that just everything's kind of cool and everything's okay. If you allow that, to, you know, you're pretty much in control of your own destiny. Uh, I wish I could say that for myself as much as I like, but you know, you're in control of your emotions. So try to not worry about things so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really try and, yeah, you know, I try not to worry about things like try to try to, be good and at this point in my life yeah i guess i would say i'd say one thing i would say the same thing i said earlier try to do whatever the hell you want to feel good without intentionally hurting someone else that's what i'd say that's good advice so i tell myself so where can people find you on the interwebs whether Uh it's your site youtube all the above yeah so I'm I'm doing uh, I'm doing you know one thing now I'm doing uh, new YouTube videos and uh, teach and also just write very very detailed write ups and teaching people how to hack how to code how to reverse engineer uh, and also teaching just regular consumers everyday consumers who have things like phones and computers and cars how to protect themselves. Um, and then demonstrating them really cool exploits and vulnerabilities, like how to steal cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd say <laughs> the best way to, ways to follow me, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, it's at Sammy Kamkar, S A M Y K A M K A R. Um, or follow me on YouTube, which is my really old username, YouTube username, S4. M Y K. Oh, Jesus. That's terrible. No, no, no. Say four, it again. What is four it? Four is like the, is like a in hacker speak. So oh, wait like a second. Sammy K. So g- give it to me again. It's like Sammy K, but Sammy K was taken, so I had to take S four M Y K. Oh, that's not so bad. It's it's kind of bad. It's bad, but it could be worse. <laughs> it was it wasn't. It was just like I never thought I'd use this. S four M Y K. Yeah, I used to play right. like Halo on Xbox, and also was S four M Y. So quick. Side note on Halo, I had a chance at one point. I had only played Halo once before, and then I had a chance to play, I think he was the world champion at the time, a guy named Fatality, and just got Sounds familiar. fucking obliterated. Like pro, in. Like, oh, yeah, he's totally pro. I think I saw his billboard on uh, like Lost, like Highland Avenue in Hollywood. Oh, yeah, he's well known. And I got, this was a couple of years ago, and it's like my second game ever. And just got so manhandled. It was utterly <laughs> embarrassing, beyond embarrassing. Awesome. All right, so we got you on YouTube. Yeah, uh, we Twitter. have you on Twitter. Yeah. I will I will link to all those in the show notes as well. Yeah, just, Anywhere else? Just my website, um, samy.pl, uh, yeah. sammy.pl. And this is where people can find the uh, tools as well. They can find all my tools. Almost everything I do is open source. It's free. Uh, I have a, a mailing list where I just send... You know, sneak peeks of new vulnerability research and tips on how to protect yourself. Awesome. This is uh, super fun. Uh, I We need to do more of these. And uh, for those interested, also did a TV show where Sammy made a guest appearance. And uh, that should be available at iTunes.com forward slash Tim Ferriss, T-I-M-F-E-R-R-I-S-S, two R's, two S's, uh, or potentially on YouTube. 
youtube.com forward slash Tim Ferriss. Also with two R's and two S's. Sammy, thanks so much, man. <laughs> thanks, more, Tim. More wine in the future. <laughs> All right. Looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by 99designs, your one-stop shop for all things graphic design related. I have used 99designs for everything from banner ads to book covers, including sketches and mock-ups that led to The 4-Hour Body, which later became number one New York Times, number one Wall Street Journal. And the brainstorming, a lot of it took place with designers from around the world. And here's how it works. Whether you need a t-shirt, a business card, a website, an app thumbnail, whatever it might be, you submit that project and designers from around the world will send you sketches and mock-ups and designs. You choose your favorite and you have an original that you love or you get your money back. It's that straightforward. And many of you who are listening have already used it and created some amazing things that I'll be sharing in the future. But in the meantime, if you want to see some of my competitions, some of the book covers, as well as get a free $99 upgrade, go to 99designs.com forward slash Tim. That's 99designs.com forward slash Tim. This podcast is brought to you by Mizzen and Maine. Don't worry about the spelling. All you need to know is this. I have organized my entire life around avoiding fancy shirts because you have to iron them, you sweat through them, they smell really easily, they're a pain in the ass. Mizzen and Maine has given me the only shirt that I need. And what I mean by that, and Kelly Starrett loves these shirts as well, is that you can trick people. They look really fancy, so you can take them out to nice dinners, whatever, but they're made from athletic sweat wicking material. So you can throw this thing into your luggage in a heap or on your kitchen table like I did recently, and then pull it out, throw it on with no ironing, no steaming, no nothing, walk out, and you could probably wear this thing for a week straight or make it your only dress shirt and take it on trips for weeks at a time. Never wash it. It will not smell. You will not sweat through it. You got to check these things out. So go to fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, fourhourworkweek.com forward slash shirts. Check it out, fourhourworkweek.com forward slash shirts, and you'll see some of my favorite gear, including the one shirt that I've been traveling with. 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 Shirt 